Hi folks, welcome to another lecture for Introduction to Literature. Today I'm going to talk about Dionysus and Sacrifice. Um, and so just a couple of preliminary things as I get going. Um, these lectures are, are pretty long and, and um, feel free to pause and take breaks and watch them over a couple of days. Um, we're in the middle of a summer semester and you have to remember that we have 15 weeks condensed into eight. Um, and if we were having face-to-face -face classes, we, we would be in class for, you know, more than two hours, almost two and a half hours, um, twice a week. Um, and that's what I'm thinking of in terms of the length of these lectures. So it can be a lot of information and you can feel a little bit inundated and, and just, just realize that you can take breaks. Also, again, remember this is an introductory class. Um, I'm not expecting you to get all of this. Um, hopefully you have already po um, posted um, onto Blackboard, for those of you who are students in the class anyway, posted onto Blackboard trying to apply Aristotle's um, terms from my last lecture to uh, Euripides' Bacchae translated by Anne Carson, which is our main text for the week. And I wanted you to do that before watching this stuff. I'm not concerned with whether or not you get answers right or correctly. I'm, I'm concerned with you thinking on your own before taking things necessarily from me. So yeah, this will clarify stuff for that and it will give answers away. And um, um, uh, I, want, I would rather you um, see your own thinking and you do your own thinking first, wrestle with the text. Then, 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 like, search for where I came up with my application of some of Aristotle's terms. Okay, so those are the preliminary things. And then one more th sort of thing from the outset. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot uh, over years, some of this stuff. But, but recently, uh, I was thinking back to when I was an undergraduate. And we used to have this class where I, I went to a, um, Metro State University as an um uh, undergraduate English major and we used to have a class it was called myth symbol and illusion um, the class is not called that anymore thankfully I'll say why in a minute it is now just called myth and literature and just that change in the ways that we think about the title of um, a myth class um, says a lot um, with the ways people think about and how they have studied myth so that what was wrong in my mind anyway um, and why I was on a committee to change the title of the class um, was there was there used to be this kind of perception that that we move kind of in a historical trajectory from myth to something like symbol and and maybe writing shows up in there as well um, that we move from oral culture into writing culture and then it is something about writing culture that gets us to illusion and that's not to say that there isn't something about that process that um, uh, um, uh, speaks well to the invention of writing um, over time. But what it had done, and the problem for me was that it mapped onto this very Eurocentric way of thinking about myth, where a kind of developmental process, an evolutionary process, um, oftentimes was sort of built into the structure and mapped onto the development of human beings. And this is something that Euro-centric um, culture, um, what I will sometimes call the European fantasy structure, um, that, uh, that has become problematic. It's tied up with colonialism, which goes back to my earlier lectures, um, and I will criticize it uh, um, um, quite a bit. It also denies, like the, what another problem there is that it denies the, um, it kind of situates myth as being in a prehistoric time, which I think is an incorrect way of thinking about myth. And if you think about my earlier lectures when I mentioned Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur, um, mythological figures that, um, yeah, they're celebrities and they're real people, but they play um, a kind of shaping force in our lives, or especially in those who are dealing in the genre of hip hop, for example, right? So. Um, uh, and then, of course, lots of folks, Mayan folks, still um, very much practice the ways um, that are recorded down in um, the text called um, Popol Vuh or Popol Vuh. 
Um, those are written down by colonizers, um, but the stories go back like 8,000 years and they're still practiced by Mayan people. And so if you situate myth back in the ancient past, then you fall prone to thinking of people who think, uh, um, who think in different ways than European sort of developmental evolution, evolutionary culture. You see them as primitive and it plays into uh, all sorts of um, culturally ethnocentric notions that um, are just sort of irrelevant today. Um, so again, it's one of those moments where when we're studying literature, we need to sort of have an idea of the ways that literature has been studied um, in the past so that we um, don't make the same mistakes and we deal with our own baggage. Um, uh, you can call that decolonizing if you want. It's a different process for different groups of people. Um, and so uh, what's important for that is that I, I still think that studying myth and mythology is very important. Even these old Greek myths that have traditionally been at the foundation of literary studies. Um, uh, but I am not looking back to sort of uh, ancient Greece as, as the cradle of some kind of like propping up Western culture. I want to interrogate the notion of Western culture um, and colonialism and all this baggage that comes with that civilization. I want to interrogate that as we go. So that is part of my um, thinking here, even though I've structured my Intro to Lit class um, to begin with an ancient Greek play. Okay, so those are my preliminary, preliminary remarks. I'm going to go to a lot of places in lecture um, this week. Uh, and so we're thinking mainly about this figure, um, Dionysus, a demigod, sometimes, uh, as he is put, uh, um, uh, sometimes thought of as half man, half god, but uh, Dionysus we know would not like that because Dionysus has a, a, a problem with, with people not recognizing his divine status. And I'm particularly going to connect Dionysus to the notion of sacrifice. So there's going to be a lot about myth, a lot about sacrifice in general, a little bit of comparative stuff to um, other regions. So India, for example, and we'll jump into Semitic culture or Hebrew culture just for comparative um, instances. And it will help us see clear, a little bit more clearly what's going on with Greece. Um, uh, and, and then we'll end my lecture a little bit more specifically on the Bacchae text and applying those Arist Aristotelian terms. So let's jump into things today here. Uh, let me click on my guy. Um, so uh, I have to keep moving my face around. Uh, I'm going to read Ann Carson's translation of Euripides about Bacchae. It's important that we deal with Ann Carson's translation because I'll point out some very contemporary and super interesting things that Carson does um, as, as um, the great poet that, that she is, in addition to being a classic scholar and translator. Um, so here we have an image of Dionysus, um, and here's the Dionysian theater um, back in Greece. Oops, um, just, just to give you a sense of um, what it looks like there. And I'm going to give you a bit of a thesis to start out with for the lecture today. Um, uh, we won't completely stick to it, but this is generally where I'm going and why I don't want us to be thinking of this mythological sacrifice lecture um, in, in some of the typical or traditional ways that um, uh, a myth, and myth has been taught within literary studies. Uh, so, um, Anne Carson's translation of Euripides' Bacchae draws on an inherent element of dissent in Greek tragedy. This is kind of, that's an argument that I'm going to make in, um, implicitly and sometimes explicitly in this lecture. In doing so, Carson not only attends to an inherent vision um, in the aged Euripides last play, uh, but also shows us how the themes of this tragedy can speak directly to our current moment. This is something that I want us to do in our class, be thinking about this ancient literature in our current moment. We're dealing with a lot of social unrest in the United States as I make this lecture. There's a lot of social unrest in the play. What connections can we make? Uh, while scholarly attention to myth, sacrifice, and tragedy has often been perceived as conservative, Carson's attention to dissent speak truth to Jonathan Dolomore's 
words from a book called Radical Tragedy that I'll be referring to a little bit um, next week when we get to Macbeth as well. Um, uh, uh, the quote here is, transgressive desire is inseparable from forbidden knowledge and together they kickstart history and become the driving forces of tragedy, end quote. And so that kickstart of history is an interesting uh, way of thinking about this, that um, if we're thinking about myth, moving from myth into more of chronological time, um, which definitely does happen with that transition from uh, the the tragedies, that kind of era um, of of maybe the, the sixth and fifth centuries, um, maybe a little bit into the fourth centuries of, of Greece, before we get to Socrates and Aristotle, where we get this kind of reflection back, the criticism, what's sometimes called the golden age, um, and, and we get this kind of more linear developmental um, notion of history. It also shows up in the Greek um, author Herodotus, or the Greek historian Herodotus, who often makes this kind of distinction between mythological time and historical time. So that conception itself is ancient. It has problems when we bring it into modernity um, what, uh, and it gets applied to so-called primitive cultures. Um, but it's there as a distinction, historical time or chronological time um, versus a mythological time to begin with. And so that kickstart of history is happening in this moment where we move from these Greek tragedies into something like a uh, historical time. Um, uh, and so this is true, and, and if this is intro class, you know, you, you might not see this, but around mythological study, um, uh, there have been a lot of problems, and in some cases uproar in recent years, um, and in different um, camps, um, that mythological scholarship lends itself to a kind of conservatism. Uh, you will notice this in, if some of any of you have seen uh, uh, lectures by Joseph Campbell or thought about things like the hero's journey, like Carl Jung, um, this is very fascinating intellectual stuff. It gets popularized and it ends, lends to a kind of reductionism. Uh, there's a great book called The Politics of Myth um, by, I believe, Robert Elwood um, that deals with uh, Mircea Eliade, um, a uh, um, Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell, all three of them very important scholars of myth in the 20th century, but all very, very conservative and sometimes fl um, flirtation, um, flirtating or being directly involved with fascism. Um, in Joseph Campbell's case, um, he's presented as a libertarian in uh, Elwood's book. I am giving a different kind of trajectory than that. Um, because I feel like, especially with introductory students, that reduction to like, oh, we can just see everything as a kind of archetype. Um, I don't want to go that way. That's a cartoonish way of thinking about mythology. And it denies historical development. Um, it makes it seem like 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 nothing ever changes and, and, and things definitely do change and morph. And changing and morphing is a really important part of myth. If anybody's ever read, the Metamorphoses, <laughs> um, uh, uh, for example, um, by Ovid, the um, Roman poet, um, who's kind of like, he's kind of showing off about showing all of the different changes he can do as a writer. And he's a great writer, um, so he's he's um, he's flourishing and sh showing things. Um, so uh, um, if, if you've heard about that stuff, it's not the hero's journey or that stuff is not worth studying. Um, it's just that it's been made a little bit too popular for my liking, and it tends towards right-wing modes of thinking. Um, so it is implicitly and theoretically biased um, towards that kind of agenda, if you ask me. And you could argue with me on that, um, uh, uh, um, and that might be a fruitful conversation, but uh, I'm not going to deal with, with archetypal thinking and such um, too much in this lecture. Okay, so Dalimore's point. And my point here is that when we look back, we can see dissent. So sometimes myth is presented as it's the thing that holds culture together. Um, William Kavanaugh has a great book um, called The Myth of Religious Violence, a religious studies book that's recent where he talks about the importance of myth 
now like so we have founding myths in the united states like george washington and the cherry tree or something like that and so what myth does is we're not just talking about like greek gods like zeus and uh aphrodite um or um apollo uh, uh hera those types of figures um we have current versions of that and they are the kind of binding elements um or binding stories that um, allow us to sacrifice ourselves. So in, in William Kavanaugh's great book, um, he talks about the ways that people might join the military and sacrifice themselves for a nation. Like uh, um, um, we or think about mil military veterans um, and veterans always wanting to, to like sort of be recognized for the work that they've done or the service that they've done for the country. Right. Um, and so because of that, there is a kind of conservationist attempt or attention within mythological studies that that what that what myth does is that binding work religio right that's giving you that definition for the term religion in just it's like the latin words meaning um uh, uh so yeah there's been a lot of attention to the ways that myth binds things together but what's interesting about carson's reading um, at least in my argument here, and Dolly Moore's reading of tragedy in general, is that a lot of times there's an element of dissent. And so I think that Euripides' last play, Bacchae, in the way what it is commenting on in terms of the society that he's seeing, I think that he's saying some quite transgressive and, and um, uh, uh, um, biting types of criticism that he's giving to a, um, a Greek culture in his particular moment. And I feel like Carson has done a really great job in her translation of bringing that out. And by doing that, she's attending, maybe not directly to um, Dolly Moore's book, but she's attending to current theory and to current discourses of literature. And that's what um, is important. It's not just that we study literature as this transcendent category. It's that the study of literature is also historical and morphs and changes over time according to the concerns of um, uh, th that we are dealing with in our own culture. And so we as aspiring critics want to be taking in our own culture at the same time as we're attending to, um, in this case, ancient culture. So let's move on here. Uh, here's uh, some quotes from Dalamore's Dol book here. Um, Dalamore is importantly criticizing um, and challenging persistent liberal, and by liberal I don't mean Democrat versus Republican, I mean, I mean liberalism, a person who is part of a culture that's based on individuals, individualism, and individuals who are capable of bearing rights. So think of it as a rights-bearing person. Um, uh, rather than a collective group of people. Um, uh, um, uh, and, and, and I was just talking to a, a scholar friend of mine on Friday this past week, um, who's from Amman, Jordan, and she was talking about being from a tribe and different um, relationships between her tribe and another tribe um, in, in Jordan and, and growing up with that and then moving on to Oxford. She's a very smart scholar and um, uh, she's very accomplished. And she was talking about that, like what, like the differences between a, coming from a kind of a culture that's not necessarily based on liberalism into a much more liberal culture and then now teaching in the United States, which is where she's teaching. Um, uh, so Dalamore is, is challenging a persistent, persistent liberal and Christian humanism in literary studies. Uh, the tendency to read for moments of redemption uh, or of a static and transcendent notion of, notion of human spirit that op operates as a mask for the critical power of literature to reveal dissent and ideological critique. And this is like this, we're always looking for literature to make us into better moral beings, um, for example, or the, like literature, like I gave you the, the example of that, that uh, tattered cover bookstore um, uh, um, idea of, of the literature is humanity in print. And if anybody's here from Denver, which is where I'm teaching this from, you will know that Tattered Cover has had a really big sort of um, explosion in recent media because of their, at first, the, their, their refusal to comment on the Black Lives Matter protests downtown where they are. And they thought that they could remain neutral. Um, and they got a lot of pushback from that, from their own community, 
lots of other writers writing a whole petition to the bookstore saying that there, there's no being neutral in matters of, of this kind of violence. And to claim that you're neutral is actually to claim a kind of white privilege notion of new, neutrality. Um, and so that's the same, that's a racialized version of this, but that critique is, is a similar version of this critique here, that a transcendent notion of the human spirit, or also the idea that we can just sort of neutrally step aside and that there's this idea of human spirit that just is always the same ab and above everything else. Um, th that has become a problem to current modes of thinking. So Dalimore says, this is a direct quote, to take art seriously is to know it comes without humanitarian guarantees, which currently smother it. Um, again, if bad times produce great books, it does not follow that great books compensate for, let alone alleviate bad times. And another example we can think about this is just like fascist Germany, for example, or SS guards who are like, you know, ex in, in busy in the process of exterminating Jews, but going back to their own barracks and reading great works of literature like Goethe. And so like reading great books of literature do not make us necessarily great people. Being one of the most highly educated societies in the world at the time did not present, prevent um, uh, Germany from sliding into a totalitarian um, dictatorial state. Um, that was capable of very, very, some of the worst crimes against humanity, right? Um, so art is not necessarily going to like make us into morally better people, but that doesn't mean that art itself is, is worthless or that we should chuck it out. And um, so this goes back to that, dis that discussion between Aristotle and Plato in earlier lectures of what art's place is. Um, and so catharsis doesn't necessarily mean making us into m what modern people might call moral good people. In Aristotle's terms, catharsis or purging might mean something quite different. And of course, it would mean something different to Aristotle than to um, kind of modern Christian notions. He's writing before Christianity even exists. Uh, so here we go a little bit further here. So let's look at um, Dionysia or um, uh, so it, the rituals that are associated with Dionysus um, uh, appear to be um, start in rural areas and then they take on different forms for rural and urban. Um, so they start in rural areas where they're tied to grape harvests. And so di that's why Dionysus is associated both with green vines and with wine. Um, and uh, those ancient ceremonies of, of transferring water into wine. Yes, it happens before the New Testament, before it's associated with the Christ figure, and it comes from earlier rituals. Um, that's another sort of argument I'll be making throughout this course is that there is no sort of pure religion, and I'll come back to that, that idea um, later on. Um, and it's a, I think that that's an important ethical theme to think of in current society um, that wants to present these types of idea notions like clash of civilizations, the Samuel Huntington notion um, uh, from the 1990s. Um, uh, Diana, so the, the festivals, uh, see he's associated with green vines and wine, with drunkenness and, and such um, the rural festivals involve processions of people carrying phalluses or erect penises baskets um, jars bread jars of water jars of wine that water and wine and off other offerings um, uh, urban festivals as they develop involved similar processions but also featured music and dramatic competitions and so competitions for musicians competitions for drama um, tragedies were performed in the theater of Dionysus, which I had an image of earlier, following a bull sacrifice. That's important to think about, that it's the bull sacrifice that kind of begins and starts the whole um, situation. You want to note how in the play that we read, Pentheus becomes associated with a bull in the play, right? So remember that Dionysus, he's masked as this kind of stranger figure. Um, he lets... Uh, lets uh, Pentheus tie him up and bind him, but he basically transfers himself with a bull. And so uh, um, when he steps out and, and uh, the, uh, the Pent Pentheus's house is sort of burning down and, and the, the, everything's um, collapsing, um, uh, he shows up again as the stranger and he tells folks like, oh yeah, I substituted myself for a bull, but Pentheus couldn't notice that. Um, 
winners of the ceremonies were awarded goats. Um, and so there are also these things called satyr plays, and satyrs are like kind of half man, half goat types, or half horse types of figures. Sometimes goats and horns show up too. Um, and this is an image of one of them. They're walking around. They always have an erect penis. They have kind of a horse tail. Um, and uh, um, they mess with people's heads. It's their job. They're, they're very clownish. Again, I'm not going to go the archetypal way of thinking about tricksters and trickster gods, um, especially um, the ways that that gets conflated with Native American clowns and sort of tricksterism. That's something because I'm very interested in native in, in indigenous studies in the United States. And I think that the comparisons that people make, even in books like Walter Otto's book, which I'm going to refer to later throughout this lecture, when they start trying to deal with Native American stuff, they get things completely wrong. And that's another problem that I see with this kind of archetypal way of thinking that we can universalize an archetype of a trickster and then map like something like a satyr going on here with the clowning that's going on in 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 uh, um, Pueblo culture, for example, to the south of me, or up at Sundance in Lakota culture. No, I want to see difference there, um, not sort of blending and universalizing things together. Uh, um, uh, and so that's the that's part of the politics of your studying myth and, and mythology and and me and my folklore colleagues um, my, my colleague Charlie Hogue and I def definitely have really fruitful discussions around ways into thinking about this and not not being overly reductive in our generalizations um, there are ways to be more nuanced and still deal with with cross-cultural comparisons flood stories creation stories things like this yes sky being close to the earth yes these features show up across different cultures, but that doesn't mean that we ought to just reduce them to all being one and the same. Um, here's an ancient art artifact that I thought was funny. Um, uh, this is a jar lid from a Dionysian um, uh, uh, festival. Um, it has features a flying penis um, or flying phallus and three vaginas from the 400s. Um, you, if you've seen Monty Python, um, uh, uh, early uh, um, cartoons and things like this and Terry Gilliam those guys you can see that kind of stuff sh re showing up um, uh, so there you have it there's a lot of very explicit sexual imagery going on um, the rituals importantly precede the criticism so in earlier lectures I have um, talked about Plato and Aristotle and the place of art and Aristotle's poetics and we're applying some of his terms back onto the plays, but that's important. It's important to notice that in what they're doing and cr what criticism does is it makes this kind of reflective move back onto a culture. Um, so criticism tries to make sense of tragedies and this signals a shift in Greek culture, a shift away from that, a shift from the embeddedness of ritual within culture. This is what um, Victor Turner will call the liminal versus the liminoid, and I'll come back to that concept later on in a book called Rich From Ritual to Theater. And he says that li the liminal is like nobody has, like you don't have a choice whether or not to go to the festival, just like Agave does not have a choice whether or not she's going to join the Bacchae. Um, uh, Dionysus makes sure of that, right? But as culture sort of moves on, as like we get this kind of distinction with chronological time, um, we get something more like the culture that we live in today, um, which uh, Victor Turner calls uh, liminoid, where it's like, it's my choice to go to a theater or to go to a movie or to go to a rock concert. And yes, I might have these kinds of transcendent types of experiences or even to go to church. Um, the great, uh, um, so there's a Catholic theologian named uh, Charles Taylor who writes a big thick book called The Secular Age. He says that our current era is ca ca um, characterized by us being buffered selves, um, whereas early modern or medieval cultures, earlier culture um, was more porous. Um, and so we see ourselves as being individuals, that liberal self, 
and is being sort of buffered by culture. But we also, one of the things that characterizes our cultures is not that religion has gone away, but that religion is one choice among many. I could choose or not choose to go to, to church. Many people choose to convert or to try out one religion. You know, you're born in like a kind of Christian culture and that's like, oh, I'm gonna become a Buddhist now. And oh, I didn't like that, but maybe I'll go more to, toward Taoism or Hinduism or uh, no, I'll do radical shift to go to Islam. Uh, and and so that kind of the idea, that kind of shopping for religion type of culture, that's a book um, by Donald Latner, I, want, I think it's called Shopping for Religion, uh, uh, is characteristic of our commodity driven culture itself. Um, and so that's just something to think about. Um, uh, in a famous book, if I come back to my slide here, um, there's a so that's part of modern culture and and a good way to think of that this is the shift to high modernity in literature in a famous book on Greek tragedy by the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche titled The Birth of Tragedy in the Spirit of Music this is from 1872 it's a good point to think about that the shift towards high modernism um, or literary modernism uh, he compared um, Dionysian impulses of frenzy to Apollonian impulses towards rationality. And so Dionysus and Apollo both end up being in Athens together, um, but at first they reject, even in Athens, they, re they reject um, Dionysus. Just like in Thebes, in the play that we've read, um, they have rejected Dionysus um, first. And, and the, the civilization, the city, the polis, um, has havoc wreaked upon it for not recognizing um, uh, uh, Dionysus. Um, so in, in Athens, it's, it was, as I said in an earlier lecture, um, when people reject Dionysus, all of the men get um, uh, genital diseases until, <laughs> until they accept the god. Um, so uh, Nietzsche, in making this kind of comparison to the Apollonian and to the Dionysian, um, he's also critiquing the notion of civilization and a golden age of Greek philosophy that he, where he speculated um, that there was a shift towards critical reflection and that that evidence should just have one E there. Um, uh, that, that, that rather than the, the, us celebrating the classical era, which is what the Renaissance culture did and a lot of um, English and, and just sort of European culture had done seeing like, oh, the Greeks, we should worship the Greeks in the golden age of civilization. Um, uh, Nietzsche said, what if we think about what we call, we're calling the golden age, like Plato and Aristotle, what if we see that as actually the twilight, or even these, these plays, these Greek tragedies, as the twilight, as the sun setting on an earlier, greater civilization? Um, and there is a little bit of romanticism involved in that, like, oh, couldn't we get back to an earlier time? Um, and Nietzsche himself later on criticizes his own, his own thinking in that early book. Um, but uh, at the same time, he was very, it's a very influential book, and he was criticizing um, uh, an earlier version of Romanticism. And, and, and he's at the same time criticizing that notion of, of civilization and, and a particularly Christian-oriented civilization. Uh, um, some things that show up um, when we're thinking about um, Dionysus and we're thinking about sacrifice and um, just sort of other regional stuff around the, the culture. Um, uh, there's a lot of comparisons to goats and scapegoats. And of course, the so goats are part of the ceremonies um, of the, um, the Dionysian ceremonies, but the goats are awarded to people. Um, and uh, you see patterns of, of sacrifice showing up a little bit different in different cultures. Um, so one of the patterns that shows up is the idea of the scapegoat in the region. And I already mentioned, I'll talk about it again, the book by Rene Girard, who I disagree with in some ways, um, but he's still an important scholar. Uh, um, the scapegoat, that's, a, that's one place to look for this. Also, uh, also on Greek um, culture, let me just grab the book here. Um, Uh, Walter Burkhart, um, Greek religion is another one to, that's worth checking out um, uh, for if you want to go more into this and the way it relates to Greek, Greek culture. Um, what I want to hit here is that within sacrifice um, and Dionysus, um, that there's a notion of twinning or doubling 
and this kind of maneuvers throughout the ancient Near East, um, but shows up in culturally specific different ways. So for example, if we go to across the sea, right, if we go over into um, current day um, Israel um, uh, and Middle East, um, uh, Jordan, and then um, uh, um, so, uh, so you've got, well, you can look it up on a map. I'm, I'm going to assume you guys know where Greece is, where Lebanon and Israel is kind of east of them in the Mediterranean, and then Egypt down, down to the south. Um, so Leviticus, which is a um, uh, um, book from the Torah or the Tanakh, um, or the Pentateuch, the first five books of what the Christians call the Old Testament. Um, uh, this is kind of going on and, and compare it to the around the same time that these Greek tragedies are being developed and then eventually performed in festivals um, across the sea over in Greece. Um, so Leviticus, which is kind of the book that talks about laws um, and rules um, for um, uh, uh, um, um, ancient Jewish people, um, we see um, this showing up. So this is um, the passages are 16, 21 to 22. Um, then um, uh, the, the scapegoat involves two, two separate goats, right? Um, uh, then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of a, the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all of their transgressions, all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and sending it away into the wilderness by means of someone des designated for the task. The goat shall bear on itself all their inequities to the barren region and the goat shall be and, um, and the goat shall be set free and the wilderness and then a lot of times there's another goat that is that that is the kind of pure goat and that gets sort of sacrificed or offered up to a god or sometimes eaten among the people uh, um, as well and so um, uh, not necessarily in this culture but sometimes uh, um, uh, so there's there's this doubling and there's this idea that we can take all of our bad stuff and put it on to this goat and send it away sometimes they, they chase it off a cliff too so sometimes neither goat really it works out for either goat um, twinning also shows up in the close fraternal relationship between cousins in the play that we have read for today um, such as Pentheus and Dionysus. Um, and that's something that Gerard, um, Rene Gerard, um, again, important scholar. I disagree with him sometimes, but he's still important. Um, Violence in the Sacred by Rene Gerard points that out. Um, uh, another book to look at is um, The End of Sacrifice by Guy Strum. So that deals especially with um, uh, uh, um, Jewish notions and, and related to writing and sacrifice and the Torah and the move from temple um, culture into post-temple culture um, or rabbinical Judaism if you're interested in, in that type of study. There's a lot of really fruitful comparisons to be made between these different cultures. Um, uh, so gods are associated with places. That's something that we see in the play itself. But an interesting thing about Dionysus is that he moves around and he's said to come from the east, right? Um, and so if we compare that uh, again over to um, Jewish culture, um, and which is kind of blending in some ways, I would argue, from Babylonian culture. Um, we know if you have anybody, have, if, if you ever take a world lit class, you will read um, the Epic of Gilgamesh and you'll notice that all of the flooding stuff that happens in Gilgamesh also shows up in the Old Testament, right? Um, the editing of the Pentateuch um, um, actually happens, um, or, or the, what the first five books of what the Christians call the Old Testament um, happens in Babylon. So what's important is that um, uh, uh, there's, there's an earlier sort of temple period um, that uh, happens. Uh, there, there are two kingdoms that the Jews have. There's Israel and there's Judah. Israel is to the north. Um, and Judah is where um, we call Jerusalem today. And notice the A-H at the end of Judah and the E-L at the end of Israel. Those are important things because they refer to earlier different deities in the text. So if you are ever reading the Hebrew text, 
um, you will notice that there are lots of different gods that eventually become the one monotheistic god. Um, and the god who wins out is Yahweh, right? That's a specific god. He's a storm god, but he's also the patron god of Jerusalem or Judah, that A-H. Whereas El or Baal and there are other types of entities around the area, um, who shows up in the term Elohim or um, my Lord or um, um, uh, Adonai is a, another um, Jewish term. Um, so Jewish people don't say the name of God. They don't say something like Yahweh. Um, uh, uh, that that would be um, completely um, improper um, to say the least, um, sacrilegious even. Uh, they, they would say that you, no one can pronounce, knows how to really pronounce the real name of God. Um, and so when they see God's name, they say Adonai, um, which is a substitution. It means my Lord. Um, uh, when you see um, the name show up in different texts, so if you ever look at a translated Bible, for example, if it's translated as, as capital L-O-R-D, um, that is translating the Tetragrammaton, um, uh, which some uh, Europeans tried to throw. They, they mixed Adonai, the, the, ver, the, 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 sorry, the vowels from Adonai. They mixed it in with the Hebrew letters and tried to spell it J-A-W-E-H-O. Um, uh, um, and then in Latin, if you've ever seen Indiana Jones in Latin, um, J starts with the J down means Y. Um, and so they say Yehovah or Jehovah. They're trying to find out the name for God, which is just like totally anti um, like the ways that the, that the Hebrew Israelite, uh, the Jewish people are thinking about it. Um, but they try it. They, they try it. And so they get it wrong. Like that kind of that whole name is, is, is kind of a misreading of the whole thing. It's super interesting stuff to think about. Uh, um, so Torah, again, and there's that A-H there at the end of that word. Torah means law or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. Um, uh, that's being written down um, and developing and edited um, in post-exilic times. So what happens is first um, there's a... Um, there's a Persian Empire that comes in and it first invades the north um, up in Israel, the city of Israel, the culture up there, and then eventually comes down and uh, invades uh, and, and destroys the temple in 586 BCE, destroys the temple of Judah. So that's the end of the first temple period. And then we get exile. And so a lot of the elite Jewish people are taken um, uh um, in slavery back to Babylon um, and eventually then or then they're let free later on by Cyrus um, uh, and uh, then they start rebuilding the temple and it's only in that this different period so after like 519 ish I think is, is like they're set free and then 519 ish they start rebuilding the, the temple um, then we get that that's the second temple period and it's during that period that we see a lot of these very strict laws showing up a lot of a shift away from that earlier northern culture um, to a strictly jerusalem based version of jewish culture and uh so the return i say um ezra is a scribe he's also you know there's a book of ezra if you look at the um the the um, um the torah um uh is a scribe sent to cyrus um to ensure that Jews observe Jewish law. So basically the laws become really important because it's kind of like the, the kind of elite Jews get let go after captivity and they're like, okay, you can go over there, but you gotta hold your stuff together. You gotta have a civilization. And so they come back after being colonized to kind of becoming colonizers. And that's an important thing to think. I will use that term colonizer. Um, so. Uh, the return of the Jews from exile bring a new Jewish religion that opposed Israelite religion. And it emphasizes families and tribes and documenting lineage. And so there's this kind of blend. Remember I said that there's no pure religion. Um, uh, after Ezra, for the first time, we get anti-intermarriage um, rules instituted. 
lineage and bloodlines begin to matter. This affected lower classes who were not originally exiled to Babylon. It also affects the northerners and reinforced a northern split. So northern northerners even and even some of these cultures exist today claimed Mount um, Gerizim. Um, it's a Samaritan and Seshem Napolis. So Samaritan culture is actually Jewish culture, but they, there's if you know stories from the Bible, you know that they, you know, don't see them as such. They're kind of they're not Gentiles. They're Samaritans. They're these other people. Um, the city of David, which is we're talking about Jerusalem here, um, uh, old Jerusalem, is um, the archaeology from the seventh and eighth to seventh centuries BCE show that inside of typical Israelite houses um, excavated in Jews Jerusalem that there were female figurines that will be a theme that shows up notice how females and female figurines show up um, notice how Demeter or Semele gets asso associated with each other as being Dionysus's mom Dionysus's relationship with nymphs um, uh, Dionysus is like the snakes association um, with um, Pythia the, um, or the, the Pythian oracle in Rome, this female virgin who's Apollo's oracle, and Apollo has that kind of connection to Dionysus. Notice the gendered relationships. They're very important, and they've been underplayed like much of women in, in, <laughs> in patriarchal history. There's been a sort of downplaying, and so it's important to notice the balance uh, here. So, um, uh, what what's great and interesting about these ancient excavations is it shows that there was a blend of these other deities and households and then you get this very strict culture coming in saying no idols none of this other stuff um that really um, shows up so there were pagan practices and also in um ceremonial sites that we now see more um archaeologists see more uh mixture of like uh, earlier like like astro astrological stuff going on and really really ancient um, Hebrew sites as well so that's um, stuff for maybe another day that when we're not when we're focusing more specifically on Jewish texts or Jewish literature um, these are important features though of Jew Jewish literature and I'm pointing this out as a comparison to the Greek stuff that we've been reading we're not reading this stuff in this class but it will become important when we get to um, Sila Satterstrom's book later on in the semester, her book Slab, which is a meditation in many ways on Lamentations, the book of Lamentations from the Old Testament, as well as the book of John um, from the New Testament is a lot. There's a lot of that going on. Um, so here are some features of um, post-exilic, so coming out of Babylonian captivity. Um, Jewish literature that's different than some of the Greek stuff that we're seeing. So there's a sage that appears um, here, and Ezra is one of them, the priest. He becomes kind of a former a forerunner to the first rabbis. Um, the Jewish diaspora is no longer a threat, but a fact um, during the period. <clears throat> While some had stayed in Babylon, others returned to Jerusalem, and they're setting up this very strict culture. And then after 70 current era, when the second temple is destroyed, um, uh, there's no more cultic center. So the kind of diaspora for Jewish people is this shift away from temple culture into writing types of culture. And again, you um, uh, Guy Strums's book, um, the end of sacrifice is really good on that. So writers of what people now call the Bible, there was no concept of the Bible until after 70 current era. So when we think about ancient literature and stuff, there's no concept of Bible, even when like the Christian's savior, when, when, when Jesus Christ is alive, there's no Bible, there's no concept of Bible. It's a later edition. It's a later idea. Um, so, uh, the writers, and that's why it's in quotes there, of the books that then become collected as the Bible, which means um, uh, the library, Ta Biblia, um, uh, are pro-Judah. They're pro that A-H thing, right? They're pro-Yahweh, that guy. Um, and they're exclusively Yahwist against um, an inclusive Yahwism in Israel, but they're blending um, two cultures together. Um, and so my, my screen just froze, so I'm just going to pause and start again really quick here. This might be a time for you to pause and take a break, too. I know there's a lot of information. Um, so hang on, and I'll be right back. <laughs> 
back. Sorry for that interruption. Um, maybe you got a glass of water, which is, I drink a glass of water too. Um, so yeah, we're talking about features of post-exilic Jewish literature um, in comparison to the, the Greek stuff that we read officially for this week. Um, and I was talking about how the Bible, um, concepts of the Bible, the, the, the idea, idea of a Bible is like way, way well after sec, the Second Temple Falls. Um, uh, and so, uh, the, but the people who write down these um, books, and they're written down on goat skin, so that's an important thing to think about. The goats, sacrifice, like the scapegoat, all of that. And um, its relationship to what becomes later on notions of scripture. So there's also no no notion of scripture uh, in the ancient time, and this is important because there are people today. There are many religious groups who look like you know claim theologically, for example, the inerrancy of scripture or the idea that the Bible is this sort of like 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 set thing, and that's the you know that's their belief. That's the way. That's that's you know, their theology, but historically, when we look back, there was no concept of that at the time. So it's not like, like the people who are around in the period are like, like, let's go grab our Bible. <laughs> there is none. They just like the, 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 the idea of that collection wouldn't work. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, as I say here, I was talking about Yahweh and how there's a, there, there are many different gods. They kind of get formed together. They get redacted is the word that we use that edited together um, and all the story are, the people who are putting the stories together um, sometimes we call them uh, him the the deuteronomist redactor um, the person who writes deuteronomy um, and and so yahweh kind of wins out over everybody else um, uh, through other woven stories if you ever take classes on the book of genesis for example you'll see that there's the eloist tradition there's the Yahweh tradition, and for sometimes the, there's the priestly tradition, although some scholars challenge whether or not that's an actual thing. But definitely the two, the Yahweh and the Eloist. Um, <clears throat> uh, so Yahweh was a patron saint of um, Jerusalem, the city of Judah, um, uh, um, but originally sat side by side with others. There used to be more. The centralization of the Yahweh cult occurs only in Jerusalem. Zadokites were the first were priests in Jerusalem's high priesthood um, and they are, you can compare them to Qumran which is the site where people found the Dead Sea Scrolls and I have a lot to say about Dead Sea, sea Scrolls if anybody wants to talk about them with me in office hours but um, we're, I'm not going to go there today. Um, but some of the other group, um, sort of deities who are around here are Bel or Baal um, who's a god of the Canaanites and the Phoenicians. Uh, the Hebrews get the language, their alphabet from the Phoenicians. Um, Jezebel um, um, it has that, that end, right? Like the end of the B-E-L name. And then there's Asherah, El, Baal. Um, this is the Tetragrammaton that um, people mistakenly call um, called Jehovah. <laughs> um, uh, these are all at different sites, but Asherah was associated with Baal and at other times with Israeli gods as a male escort deity to a female consort or fertility figurines. And those figurines that we see in the ancient Jew, um, uh, excuse me, Jer um, households in Jerusalem and the oldest part of Jerusalem or the city of David. And so you see that gendered balance Thing shifting over into what becomes the patriarchal culture. Um, inter interesting to compare that. We'll compare that ag again to um, the gender stuff with Dion Dionysus. Um, so also, if I jump, so if I jump over again, they, they say that Dionysus travels and that he comes from the east, right? Um, and I've been in some. Uh, um, scholarly um, discussions at times or panels with people who are maybe um, a better classicist, like I'm not exactly a classicist uh, um, in terms of my training, but I know a lot from religious studies. Uh, um, um, we know that, that as far east as India, there are, it seems like people were definitely celebrating Dionysus, um, but there's also the idea that he's associated with uh, um, Alexander the Great um, which is a kind of later figure who goes and conquers the East. Um, and at some times, um, uh, so Alexander, um, 
uh, or, or Mark Antony, sorry, um, uh, Antony and Cleopatra. So one of the things that Antony was known for was for calling himself Dionysus and going on and causing all this destruction. So there's maybe some hubris going on in terms of, of, um, of Mark Antony. Um, uh, so we can't really get into that, but it's an interesting um, uh, a thing to think about. Um, so definitely um, as far east as India. Um, and, and so back in what is called India, and it only becomes called India later on. So the British colonizers call it, this for, it's the name between the Indus rivers for these, these, um, uh, these people. And that's where we get the term Hindu or from Indus, from Hindu. So people back then, and, and you know, it's to some extent today, the idea of Hindu is, is, is kind of a, a, a later concept than what people actually practice. Um, but if we look at the, definitely the ancient literature from the period um, uh, called the Vedas, um, particularly the Rig Veda, and for Vedantins today, there's a, that's a one offshoot of people who are dealing with uh, these practices or Vedanta culture. Um, uh, the Sanskrit words, so that's the old, old um, language, um, uh, and it has a relationship with Proto-Indo-European, which is what gives birth to all of the European languages, which it includes English, of course. Um, uh, there, the Sanskrit word for sacrifice, yajna or yedna, yednya, um, uh, can importantly um, mean a withdrawal rather than an action. So if you think about Aristotle, and um, my lecture last week, um, and this focus on action, um, there's um, th that's an interesting comparison that, that people might think about the idea of sacrifice in really different ways. And we don't necessarily want to universalize the notion of sacrifice, right? So I've been sort of hitting that. That's why I'm doing this kind of comparative thing, because a lot of times people try to reduce everything to kind of one structural model, and that can be really, really limiting in thinking about uh, the differences of cultures. Um, so in the Rig Veda, for example, sacrifice is tied to rituals from regarding Soma. And so this actually text is taken from a book that I wrote um, called A Transatlantic Political Theology of Psychedelic Aesthetics. Um, uh, I'll talk about psychedelics in a minute here. Uh, but in the Rig Veda, um, Soma, um, there's, there's a whole bunch of, of stuff about the Soma sacrifice. And Soma kind of means a plant, a deity, the juice from the plant, the people who are um, pressing the juice out of the plant and ingesting it. So there's a lot of fluidity to what Soma, is, this entity, means. Um, uh, in uh, a article called On the Significance of Soma, there's a Sanskrit scholar named Bis Biswanath um, Mukhopadhyay um, who historicizes the development of the term as follows. Soma first met the inebriating juice of plants. So I was studying psychedelics, inebriating juice, Dionysus, wine, getting drunk, all of that stuff, right? The inebriating juice of plants. Secondly, the plants bearing the soma. Thirdly, the elixir of life and delight. And lastly, the god. He mentions that it's derived from the Proto-Indo-European root su, which means to press. Um, soma in the Vedas also is also related to music, along with deities Agni, fire, and Savitur, <clears throat> uh, but it is a, a particularly associated with the Anistub meter in the creation of a sacrifice. In a related article on the Bhagavad Gita, which is a much later text, um, Mukhopadhyay discusses the distinction between divine and mortal Soma, saying, quote, it is through the power and inspiration of this drink alone that the victorious god Indra accepted the task of killing the fearful demon Vritra. Soma is associated with Sri Krishna's celestial singing in the Sama Veda, um, and it dates far, as far back to uh, uh, 1700 BCE. So this is much older than the stuff that we're looking like a thousand years older. Like, um, and of course it's later, like because of the ceremonies that they're much older than that. We just first see them being written down when writing is sort of first emerging um, about 3000 ish years ago in this area anyway. Um, so Soma persists throughout later Indian, Indian literature. Um, and the, in the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna tells Arjuna, who's the kind of the main hero of the epic, that Krishna is Arjuna himself. 
Um, and so there's this blending of the person, the, the human and the God, right? And we see that going on with the stranger and Dionysus, like that the gods can take um, initial form, uh, um, but there's not exactly the reincarnation thing necessarily going on. Um, there's just the ability to, to appear in many different ways, sometimes simultaneously. Um, Soma is the entheogen par excellence. Entheogen just means a God-infused substance. It's a re recently coined term from the 70s. Um, this is about the ingestion of the sacrifice. So in ceremonies like the Eucharist in Christianity, for example, there's this ingestion of the body and the blood of the wine. The word Soma comes to mean body in our culture, like, like, like a psychosomatic um, illnesses. The psycho is this part and the Soma is the body part. Uh, um, so there is something to do with ingestion going on in these ceremonies and getting drunk and inebriated and all of that stuff too. And of course, because I've been studying psychedelic um, aesthetics and psychedelic culture um, in some of my scholarship, I've been interested in the ways that this stuff shows up. Um, there's a whole mytholog study of mythological stuff, and, and I have a lot of things to say about that. Again, not too much part of today's lecture, but if you want to talk to me about it in office hours, I've got lots to say. Um, so if I keep going on here, Soma continued. Um, Soma uh, is, uh, the ancient meaning of Soma can be linked to the part that it plays as the oblation, um, uh, um, what is being given in a sacrifice, a unifying aspect of the mortal and the divine. Thomas Oberlies argues, for example, quote, that the divine draft of Soma signifies political and powerful power and legitimizes rule. There's something about what is happening in sacrifices is establishing legitimate rule. And thus, that's my, why we might see somebody like King Pentheus losing his kingship over it, right? So this is quite interesting. Um, and then again, if we compare that over to uh, um, the Jewish notions, um, the kings that are going on, once kings start with King David in the Hebrew tradition, like they're not good people. They're not people that you don't really want to sort of mimic the people, the kings. They're, they're very flawed. In, um, and in fact, like, like, like the Jewish God is like, when the, the people are like, we need a king, we need somebody to be our leader. The Jewish God is like, why am I not enough? Right, so he gets jealous. Um, and so, so the f kings in the Jewish lineages are all very flawed characters themselves. Um, so interesting comparison there. Uh, Thomas Oberly argues that access to the divine draft Soma signifies political power and legitimizes rule. Those who took the Soma became a political elite. Jared Whitaker, another scholar, disagrees with Oberly's though and s asserts that um, the terms presser or susbi in uh, uh, Sanskrit and the non-presser represent a separ separation of Vedic society into two halves, one that participates in the Soma cult and one that's excluded from it. In either case, it appears that access to Soma was meant for those who were privileged and those who were non-pressers were off, sometimes, I guess, looked down upon for not participating in the cult. While it's unclear to what extent Soma pressing de determined something like citizenship, um, it uh, is certainly a term that distinguished an identity group, even if it that was only a group of priests. Partaking in the sacrifice then determines an inclusion in a kind of cosmology. Um, and so this is a, important. Again, um, I draw our attention to, to, to Victor Turner's book from where he's talking about the relationship of theater and drama to sacrifice from ritual to theater and he says that there's a liminoid thing that that, that he, he he said or lim, liminal versus liminoid and the liminal is like you don't have a choice you must participate versus liminoid is that the more current version where you have a choice um, but even that even in ancient times we see that not necessarily everybody participated but there's a kind of exclusion process and I'll I'll relate that to the Eleusinian mysteries in a few minutes here. Um, uh, if Mukhopadhyay from the earlier slide is right in relating Soma to the relationship between Krishna, who's a Vedic um, deity, um, and Arjuna, who's the hero of the epic of the Bhagavad Gita, um, the conception of the divine inspiration and merge transcend the trans sacrificial ritual and eventually relate to Dharma. This is an Eastern concept. 
uh, of upholding the natural order of things. If ingested, then Soma would inspire one to act rightly. So there's that kind of notion of action as well. Um, uh, in acting rightly, one performs a kind of citizenship in the Soma, Soma cult. To press and drink Soma was part of a sacrificial ritual. So this is just something that ritual and ceremony and sacrifice is doing, is it has to do with who is in and who is out. But we also see with Dionysus himself as embodying a kind of inness and an outness, a rural versus a urban um, culture, for example. He's associated with fer fertility. He gender bends, for sure. There's the cross-dressing that happens with, with Pentheus. He's getting titillated by wearing women's clothes um, in uh, the Bacchae. Um, those are here are a couple of the, the things I've cited if you want to look them up. I, the other people like Whitaker, if you want to um, uh, email me, if you really get into this stuff, um, I can give you those sources. Um, so let's talk about Dionysus now. Okay, so Dionysus has a family history, and um, so Pentheus is clearly associated with the polis. He's a cousin of Dionysus, um, and vis visiting Dionysus comes and disrupts the polis with, with um, this rural revel revelry um, that people reject. And part of the story is that the family rejects Semele, so Semele, who is um, Dionysus' mom, they say that oh, Sem Semele really got knocked up by um, a regular person, but at, like out of wedlock or without like the father's permission. And so they say like like that she was trying, people were trying to lie and make a bigger thing out of it. Um, she couldn't have really been doing this herself because of course we know she is like destroyed in the process of, of um, um, giving birth to Dionysus, but apparently the, the relationship with Zeus was going on before then, so maybe she was bragging. Um, and other people just didn't believe that Zeus, she was actually having an affair with Zeus. Um, so Dionysus is sensitive about being recognized as a god. He's a twice-born god um, because his mother's body is destroyed when Zeus shows his full self to her. Um, he reaches into her womb, pulls out out the um, uh, baby Dionysus and puts it into Zeus's thigh where he gestates and then explodes from Zeus's thigh. So sometimes called a twice born God. Uh, um, he's sensitive about recognition. Um, apparently in Athens, I've already said this, he's rejected at, they rejected his a festival and the men became plagued with uh, genital disease until they decided to recognize Dionysus. So it's not just happening in Thebes. Remember, he's a, he's a god that, that travels around. Dionysus is the son of Zeus and Semele. Semele is a daughter of Cadmus, spelled K with a K in the text, um, who's the founder of Thebes. And so their lineage of, it's not just Pentheus, it's the whole lineage and the foundation of the city itself that we want to be reading into um, this kind of dichotomy between rural and city that goes on. Um, Ann Carson notes that Dionysus shows up on Linear B tablets at Thebes, which would date back to between 1450 to 1200-ish BCE. Um, so both Greeks and the Hebrews get um, their language from the Phoenicians, um, uh, who are called various different names. They're kind of coastal people. Um, uh, and 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 uh, they get it at different times, and so there's linear A and linear B, and um, and and there's some there's some reversals of the the words, and so even if you're learning like Hebrew or Arabic, you'll notice that the some of the letters are the same letters that we use because um, we've adopted the Greek alphabet, but they're turned just backwards, and they actually read from right to left, and so they read in the opposite direction as well. Um, uh, interesting ancient writing stuff. Uh, so here's some mythological theories. If we're thinking about like, like, so there's Dionysus, the god, the myth. I've mentioned already that everybody's showing up to these Greek tragedies and they already know the myth. The audience knows the stories of this stuff. So they're really there to see how a playwright like Euripides is dealing with this. Later on, mythological scholars have come up with different ideas about uh, or theories of myth. And these are some important ones. So there's the etiological, and this is the notion that actually myths were, were um, 
really actual things that happen or, or, or sorry um sorry it's that the notion that they're, they're a device for showing how the world came to be so like in a creation or an origin story um that there's an etiology or there's a causality that shows up um so that's that's one thing and so we have myths of like well how how did the sun and the moon get there for example and this happens you know in different ways across different cultures um uh for example um, let me think in, in Greek culture in ancient ancient stuff you first have Gaia or earth goddess and you have Uranus or the sky Uranus um, and sky um, comes down and meets um, Gaia right um, you have Isis and Osiris in Egyptian culture as well there's a lot of sky and then rebirth stuff going on um, I won't continue on with with mythological stories that we're not quite focused on today um, the other um, way of looking at myth is the euhemerist version. And this is a this is a notion that actually myths are kind of legends or things that have sort of been blown out into legend um, from a distorted actual event that happens in the past. So Sigmund Freud was a euhemerist in his famous book, Totem and Taboo, um, as were many early anthropologists from the late 19th century, late 1800s. Um, such as E.B. Tyler and also the famous poet who's also a folklorist and um, kind of amateur anthropologist, W.B. Yeats. Um, so they want to see the, this historical time and that shows up in that European fantasy structure I talked about at the beginning of my lecture where um, during this period the Europeans saw themselves as the most developed culture and some of that unfortunately still persists today in people's notions of civilization. Um, even in the United States and, and in terms of American exceptionalism. So be very, very wary about it when people are praising civilization. There's a lot of racism that's embedded in that notion, a lot of ethnocentrism, um, a lot of cultural elitism going on in that notion. Um, Freud basically was theorizing that that basically like in ancient times some sort of prehistoric time you had a bunch of apes and there was like a dominant ape like a silverback gorilla from my earlier slides and that he had sexual dominance over all of the women and so the younger sons sort of get together and they band together and they overthrow the father and you see a lot of overthrowing of the father in Greek um, mythology as well um, of sons killing their fathers and that's part like so this kind of lineage thing going on as well and uh, so what Freud believed was that that was actually um, that there's something sort of in our internal like the history of our own development of consciousness and so he really did think that this stuff was biological in our brains somewhere we just couldn't have found it yet and that um, what happened was the 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 all of the young sons they they kill the father and they you know have sex with the women and apparently the women have no choice in any of all this this is just like part of the problem with freud right <laughs> um, uh, uh, and then they start feeling guilty for having killed the father and they also start fighting each other for dominance because now there's nobody who's in charge and so what they do is they create a totem um, or they create a symbol of the father in memory of the father and then they all start worshiping it and this is where these early anthropologists and and Freud starts trying to historicize and put the development of religion on a kind of evolutionary scale. And of course, they see themselves as Europeans as the most highly developed, as opposed to so-called like primitive cultures, right? And, and that's something that we need to like really, really challenge today. And a lot of people who haven't studied this stuff before, they take that they they take these notions like like the hero's journey or the archetypal theory and they don't have that kind of background of seeing the ethnocentrism inherent in some of those ideas and so then they take an overly reductive notion of this stuff um it's, it's really important it takes a long time i know how long this is taking to to unpack but it's important to think about in terms of all literary study not even just myth um, and again, it's why we shouldn't think of myth as being only ancient and then literature coming later on. Or we should be more flexible with our notions of literature between oral culture and written culture, just like we're flexible with notions of literature now between uh, books and TV, 
or books and film, right? Different modes of media. We can read film as literature with a capital L. It doesn't have to just be books. It never was just books. Book codices are invented by Christians, but there's, there's scrolls, there's goat skins, there's uh, a papyri or like papyrus um, stuff, different ways of writing things down. There's quipu cultures in South America that use rope, um, which um, scholars believe is a type of writing, although it hasn't completely been decoded. There's the Mayan stuff, which is invented like 8,000 years ago. <laughs> like this stuff is really, really old. Writing doesn't just happen in one place. Civilization doesn't happen in one place. Civilization is not one linear trajectory that ends up in becoming Europe and Europe, which colonizes the rest of the world. And then not an American empire, which imagines itself as the inheritor of Europe and then tries to put its stuff all over the rest of the world. Um, so it's very, it's, it gets very political and it's, really important to think about this stuff and just like we would want to go back and critique freud for his like sort of gender issues um we want to look at the historical stuff we want to see where these theories are sort of coming from yes there may be might be some compelling things about the theories but there's a lot of flaws in them and we have to unpack the flaws without just sort of accepting theory and go on with it, as, as fun as it might be to just sort of start making grand generalizations about different cultures and universalized notions of sacrifice. Um, so another way that mythological theories have tried to deal with myth is that myth is, the, is psychological or archetypal, and this is, I've already said some of this stuff, various characters are then read as aspects of oneself. Uh, I find this really reductive, as I've said. Um, it's crypto right-wing conservative and sometimes even fascist. Um, it's especially combined with when you are um, combine it with notions of archaic revivals, neo-shamanism, and the hero's journey. Um, and this is very popular um, stuff. Like there's a lot of people, a lot of people who would not see themselves as like crypto fascist or anything, who would call themselves neo-shamans. Um, who are working on this stuff. They're trying to be more culturally diverse, um, but we can also think about um, things like Burning Man festivals or burners. There's a lot of um, historical and scholarly critique to be made rather than just sort of, you know, printing up a card like one person I know who just like printed up a business card and just like started calling himself a shaman, went into practice for it. It's like, yeah, here I am. Like, you know, another, it's happened, I've seen it a number of times, like another, um, a, a, a woman I knew who had like a business card like this is like just a couple years out of high school um, who just had a business card it said, said it's like novelist painter shaman here you go um, uh, I want to be more critical about those terms and I have a lot to say about shamanism again you can email it to me um, there are figures like Tiresias in the play who seem to have a kind of prophet-like ability to see, um, and Ezra. But Ezra seem, in Hebrew culture seems to be doing some different things as well than Tiresias. I don't want to see them just as being shamans, and I don't want to universalize a prehistoric notion of the shaman and, that, and, and say that we can just get back to that. Nor do I want to read indigenous cultures um, in the ways that anthropologists sometimes still use the term shaman, like in South America, for example, as a kind of category for a functional category for what a certain person in a certain group does. I don't want to read that as a universalized notion, nor do I want to say that indigenous cultures have an necessarily an unbroken lineage tradition to an ancient past. Because um, then you get into these um, really problematic areas where you get basically white people going and wanting to have an authentic experience by by appropriating um, other other groups um, and this happens a lot and I've, I've just written a dissertation on ayahuasca religions from south america that deals with some of that critique of some of that stuff um, um, as it comes up into to the north and enters yoga studios and stuff um, so etiological causality you hemorrhist that there was an actual past that's been distorted over history into legendary stuff and then psychological or archetypal readings um uh theorists some theorists and this show this is why i think walter otto even though i might have some problems with his text 
And by the way, I have problems with like all sorts of texts. It's just part of being a critical thinker. I, I get a lot out of these texts. But Walter Otto's book, um, he gets so mad at these kind of new theories. And he says, he says all of this like denies the idea and the power of the cult itself. The cult itself, itself was so embedded in culture that it wasn't something that you could necessarily step out of and reflect on. Or the same thing that Victor Turner means in terms of the liminal versus the liminoid. And so he says all of this, these kind of modern theories that like we can like go and like, like record even like Native American myths and like write them down and sort of be like, oh, yep, see how it fits into the function here. And we just put all the pieces together into a taxonomy. And like then we get like uh, um, um, Coca Pelli, who's kind of a trickster figure who we can just map onto um, with. Uh, I don't know who's another trickster uh, figure like Dionysus or something like it's like it's like no 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 like there's so much misunderstanding when you try and reduce things just to a kind of notion of of of, of scientific functionalism which is what a lot of scholarship in the 20th century tried to do and trying to mimic the sciences and literary studies is like we don't get paid as much and so what do we do we try to become like the scientists and we make these kind of categorical distinctions that can be very very problematic um, so it's important to criticize um, any of the European notions that develop on what I call the quasi evolutionary tendency um, and this came from a culture which was largely a Christian culture, although Freud was Jewish, that saw Christian rationality and Christianity as the most evolved religion. Lots of Christians in the United States, maybe not all Christians, but the ones who are promoting kind of Christian civilization or Euro-Christian civilization are still drawing on this culturally elitist um, type of, of notion. And there's a lot of embedded... Um, stuff that's worth being critical of in that idea of Euro-Christian, which is the term I and some of my native friends use, Euro-Christian civilization is something that we need to analyze, um, even in, when we're talking about notions of whiteness in, in relation to Black Lives Matter and white privilege and stuff, seeing how much of the ideas of whiteness come from and are tied and bound within a Euro-Christian notion of culture is a very important thing to pack up or sorry, to unpack um, for a reading on that. If you want to email me, I can send you a link, but you can look on uh, uh, the website. The New Polis has a great essay on the term Euro-Christian by the Osage, Washage Osage scholar who's a mentor and friend of mine named Tink Tinker. He has an essay called What Are We Going to Do With White People? And it's really, really relevant to now, to thinking about race, to thinking about white privilege and he's a native american he's not african-american but it does relate quite a bit to the some of the black lives matter stuff so i would point people in that direction so i want to go on i want to criticize this kind of evolutionary tendency it's a tendency that i call the uh euro christian fantasy structure and at the same time as i've said in earlier lectures this does not mean just because they're wrong or they're worth criticizing that we just never read freud again or we never read Rene girard again or like like it's important to understand where the flaws are to pay attention to these scholars and to point out where they're wrong um, until until we don't need to anymore but right now we we need to unpack where some of this stuff gets embedded in our culture so in a really famous book called Violence and the Sacred by uh, René Girard, it comes out in the early 70s, um, he says, um, uh, this is a passage from, from his book where he's talking about Dionysus in particular. And he says religion, um, and that Dionysus, looking at Dionysus shows us that religion is um, far from useless. It humanizes violence. It protects man from his own violence by taking out of his hands taking it out of his hands, transforming it into transcendent and ever-present danger to be kept in check by the appropriate rights appropriately observed and, uh, and by a most and prudent, modest and prudent demeanor. Religious misinterpretation is a truly constructive force for it purges man of the suspicions that would poison his existence for if, if he were to remain conscious of the crisis it as it actually took place now again he's got kind of sexist language he's talking about he this is his language not mine um and maybe we should take it as that because maybe he just hasn't considered the feminine enough right 
think about those fertility goddesses in the Hebrew households in ancient Israel. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so uh, one of the things that he's pointing out in, in, throughout this book is that he thinks that what's happening in sacrifice and in theater, right, and in, in tragedy is that there's this notion where we, be, we, we believe and we disbelieve at the same time. Like we know that the thing that's being sacrificed, the goat that's being run off the cliff, like we put all of our sins on it. We know that that is happening, but we know that it's fake at the same time. We know it's a symbol, but it's also not. You like, if you go the Christian route, like they have these, they, they Christians kill each other over this sort of thing, <laughs> right? The Eucharist, right? Like, is it the body of and blood of Christ? Is it really the body and blood of Christ that like, that's called transubstantiation in Catholic ceremonies, where actually it really does become the body and the blood of Christ, right? And to the to the non-Christian, by the way, this is just like that looks like cannibalism, right? You're eating the body and the blood of your God, right? Um, and then for the Protestants, it becomes um, a, a consubstantiation. It's like no, well, this is just a symbol of what happens there and, th and then there's theological debates and lots of people in, in europe killing each other in the 1500s through the 1600s especially um over just that idea right um uh so uh renee gerard is saying that what's important about sacrifice and the sacred is that there's this kind of hovers in this space between belief and non-belief we know that it's not the actual thing but at the same time that we, we believe that it is the thing uh, he says to think religiously then is to envision the city's destiny and think about this in terms of Thebes in our play uh, to think religiously is to envision the city's destiny in terms of that violence whose mastery over man increases as man believes he has gained mastery over it to think religiously in the primitive sense and that's again his term is to see violence as something superhuman to be kept always at a distance and ultimately renounced. It's kind of what uh, um, Gerard is saying here is that like the city sets itself up as being orderly, as being civilization, um, as being separate from gods. And the more and more that it does that, the more it tends to forget the power of the gods. And Dionysus kind of comes in with his violence and says, don't you forget me. Don't you misrecognize me. I'm going to bring you the violence that you know you ought to revere because it is out there and it exists and you're trying to deny the fact that this, this like, if not primitive, primordial thing actually exists and it exists for all sorts of reasons not just for destruction but for creativity itself and you need to have destruction and creativity and that that's part of what is going on with Dionysus. Um, I have some critiques again I've already said of Girard um, the European fantasy structure I've already mentioned. Um, Girard also wants to read a dissolution of boundaries between Dionysus and Pentheus um, and so he sees this as structurally similar to um, uh, Oedipus. I think that's an interesting notion. So he wants to see that Dionysus and Pentheus become kind of one person, but that tends towards that kind of psycho psychoanalytic or psycho psycho psychological critique. Um, and that's against what um, uh, Otto is saying in his book about, so it might be a little bit of his uh, historical misreading there going on um, even though I think that that's a that twinning element between Dionysus and Pentheus I think that Gerard is right on with Gerard also wants to read the arrival of Christianity this is a big critique I have with Gerard um, he wants to read the arrival of Christianity as the overcoming of sacrifice and he does this in other books and lectures um, this leads him to think that for example that Islam is backwards because um, Islam comes after Christianity, draws on so like 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 Muslims recognize that Jesus Christ was a figure. They just don't see him as the last word, right? They see Muhammad or the, the prophet Muhammad as being the last word, um, uh, and uh, as or at least being able to be divinely inspired, right? So Muhammad, just to be very clear, Muhammad himself is not a deity. Um, uh, um, or doesn't have that kind of blend between deity and man that the Christians are arguing about with the Trinity and Christ and all of that. Um, 
Um, and so he, he, he thinks that like Girard, and he says this, I give, I give you a link to the lecture in the next slide. He thinks that Islam is backward and uncivilized and think about how that kind of might play out politically since 9-11, right? If you want to, if you view Islamic culture as being, um, backwards and anti-civilization, then it draws on this entire the old centuries old notion of euro christian superiority and so yeah will people like justify use gerard's thought to justify some of the wars in the middle east and that is just exactly what happens and and i'll show you in the next slide so gerard is also entirely euhemerist and structuralist as opposed to post-structuralist even though he sometimes cites post-structuralists like jacques derrida I think that he remains very structuralist in terms of literary criticism. Again, I've mentioned this book a few times. The End of Sacrifice by Guy Strumsa is a good counterpoint. So I'm criticizing Girard. Read Girard for yourself. See whether or not you agree. He's way more famous than Professor Roger Green. He's got he's passed away now, but he's like he's had an illustrious career. He was affiliated with Stanford University. Super, super important theorist. Um, at the same time, I'm a younger scholar. Maybe I'm just being arrogant. Hopefully not too much hubris. But I have some different ways that I want to think about this stuff as a scholar um, since Girard. So here is a link um, to a video. I'm not going to play it in this um, uh, in this lecture. If you want to pause, you can watch it on your own. It's about a half hour long. There's a couple of different segments of it. Um, but I'm using this here because I disagree with Gerard, but you should get the words from Gerard himself. And at least here you can like be like, maybe I, maybe I really disagree with Dr. Green on this. And I want to see like what Gerard but I don't, is saying, but I don't have time to get all of his books or um, right now. Um, or or maybe or maybe you think that I'm biased, right? Like Dr. Green. Well, you know, Dr. Green says all this stuff about conservatives and um, like right wing biases among mythological critics. But, you know, I'm a conservative myself and I think Roger's being too biased on this in this other way. Um, by the way, I don't consider myself as being on I, like I don't like the left right spectrum, so I don't refer to myself. Um, although I try to be rather transparent with my politics, I don't consider myself on the left-right spectrum because uh, that comes from what I think is the French Revolution. Email me about it if you want to talk to me about it. Um, so, uh, but I definitely disagree, and I, 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 I just—I'll just flat out say it—I completely disagree with fascism. Ooh, yeah, I'm getting pretty bold there. <laughs> uh, I am critical of of uh, political notions or economic notions of liberalism. Um, which again, I don't confuse with, uh, don't confuse that with Democrat versus Republican or party politics in the U.S. Um, these are scholarly um, ways that I'm talking. So here's an interview with Rene Girard. Um, you can look it up on YouTube, and it's done through the Hoover Institute at Stanford. And the Hoover Institute is a conservative think tank. That yeah, it's at Stanford. It's at a really elite university, and it's paid for and very widely known to be a conservative think tank. Conservatives have been very very good at setting up think tanks, which is why they've been very very successful in the past forty years or fifty years of U.S. elections. It's so something to think about that politics is not just like people out there doing um, like, you know, campaign work, but it's also tied into our institutional structures and to the money that supports those institutional structures and the money that pays the people who work in them, including scholars like myself, although MSU Denver, where I teach, is a very different institutional structure than Stanford University. I say that with pride. Uh, um, so this interview has, has multiple parts. Um, I completely disagree with Gerard, but this is where he's saying all this stuff. And, and he says it explicitly about Islam, so I'm not taking him out of context. Um, it's an important um, example of direct contemporary political influence by literary interpretation. We literary theorists do not exist in a vacuum. There is influence on political culture. Even if I disagree with it, we are there is direct influence sometimes. And we need to think about like, you don't just like go become a literature major and be like, well, I don't like I'm I'm above politics or I'm apolitical. No, that's a political choice, as they say in the sixties. 
Um, the personal is the political. welcome to uncommon knowledge. I'm um, Peter Robinson. Uh, uncommon knowledge. Be sure is to the, follow us on Twitter is the, at twitter.com is the, forward slash is the UNC name knowledge. Of the show. Um, and um, I, I'll put my slides onto Blackboard for students. If you, you you want to watch, look at these slides, you can just click on the video in my slides works, or you can just look it up on YouTube. Uh, okay, so some boiling down sacrifice. Coming back to some more contemporary thinkers. So not just me, like it's not just the Roger show. I'm not the only one who disagrees with Rene Girard. Um, my colleague, Cleo Kearns, who has been teaching a class um, through this uh, format called Insight Seminars. They're generally free or donation-based, and so you can look up Insight Seminars. And there's one coming up this week, but she's given a couple other ones on sacrifice. I'm going to draw on Cleo's, some of the stuff Cleo says, and I'm going to embellish it with some of my own thinking, and then draw toward, toward a close. Um, uh, so uh, bullet points here. Cleo Cairns define sacrifice as, and she's at Dartmouth, by the way, I think that's where she, she's as a professor. Um, uh, a formal act of setting apart, relinquishing and destroying something of worth with the intention to open communication with the spirits. So what in Bacchae is sacrificed? That's something to think about. And what opens up that communication with the spirits or with Dionysus? Uh, by something of worth, she means something living, whole, intact, and likely decorated. So it has to be a precious thing to be sacrificed. With respect to Christianity, it falls under the category of work rather than grace. If you're a Christian, you might know some things about that stuff. I'm not going to go, go through it right now. The specific protocols must be followed. The rules must be followed because the stakes are always high in stack sacrifice. Because the stakes are high, the thing that's sacrificed has to be important. Um, it can be used to seal oaths. It can be used to establish hierarchy, um, like that stuff I was talking about with, with uh, the Rig Veda and Soma a few slides ago. Um, open spaces for divination to find out what to do. Um, to engender paternity or baptism, to discharge debt, to blur human and animal relationships. Done with intention, sacrifice always has a specific purpose. It's something, it's serious. It's something that is not done lightly. It's done between, however, um, and among volitional participants, including the victim, in quotes here, who assents to the sacrifice. And so there are even these weird ancient Greek rituals that 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 you know ask for the assent of like an animal that's being sacrificed as well. And you can say, like, well, you know, maybe that's some humans like making some assumptions about how much the animal actually assents to it, but nevertheless, theoretically, this is what's going on in sacrifice. To be continued here. Sacrifice opens a pathway from the ordinary to the non-ordinary. It is not only metaphysical, but it's theological. You have to kill or destroy your emissary, the thing that's sent out, like the bull. Or sorry, not the bull, but the scapegoat. The scapegoat is the emissary, the messenger, um, as it's sent across worlds. Death becomes a portal to send something through, moving it out of common use, changing it as it is dispatched to another domain. The killing of humans was considered the ultimate sacrifice, even in ancient times. It's paradigmatic of the victim who has great worth or value. It is capable, often capable, of masculine reprodu reproduction. Um, so think about Zeus putting Dionysus into his leg. Uh, blood is also highly adaptable to sacrifice. In principle, sacrifice must allow substitutions. It has to allow something to stand into something else for something else. Think back to my initial lectures on what literature is and literary substitution and play, the importance of play. That ties very much deeply into the, the, this notion of sacrifice. Sacrifice must allow substitutions. It's a question of a connection between different realms. Spirits also depend on humans, and so both sides depend on substitution. So the spirits will know that the thing that's being sacrificed is substituting for something else. They're, you're not duping them. 
um, to make it work, there must be some sort of non-arbitrary proportion between the sacrifice and the need. Um, money creates kind of a problem with sacrifices. Um, and uh, so it's because money tries to substitute itself as neutral compensation for everything. Like, well, oh yeah, you know, like, oh, I accidentally, you know, you know, killed your family member. Well, you know, I'll do this like multi-million dollar settlement. They're like, it might be multi-million dollars, but it's never going to bring the person back. You can't substitute that. Um, and it becomes, so it creates ethical problems. Um, gods can't be tricked. They, but they can deny. They can refuse the sacrifice. And so the spirits don't want to just be mechanical. They do want to be involved, but it requires some sort of communication. In ancient periods, and this becomes important today, will become importantly political in my next slide, slaves cannot sacrifice. In like Roman culture, for example, slaves can't do the sacrifice. You can't just tell your slave to go out and do it for you. You can't just tell oppressed people to go out and do it for you. You cannot put oppressed people into prison and call that a sacrifice. Um, because what you're actually doing is discarding people that you think are worthless. You're hiding them away. And they might have like more intrinsic human value, but that is not the same thing as sacrifice. And so if I continue here, this is be becomes really intriguing and in I'm not the only person saying this. Cleo Karens has said this. Um, there are a number of books that deal with this idea as well. So please do not take me as just criticizing Christianity and what I'm about to say here. Jesus Christ, from a scholarly and theological scholarly perspective, was not initially sacrificed. He is not the sacrifice. Although you see these things like the crowning of thorns, things that come from the scapegoat sacrifice as being image, imagistically imposed on him. So it would signify to the people who do write the New Testament, none of the people who write the New Testament are around when Jesus is around or know him personally. The earliest stuff is St. Paul, and he never knows him. He just meets him, well, you know, depending on your belief, he meets him on the road to Damascus. But this is being written down in the 50s, like like 20 years ish after the cross sort of situation. The next early book we get is after 70 CE, the fall of the temple, which is Mark. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're, they're all later. Um, so Jesus Christ is not initially sacrificed. He was executed, though. The Romans executed him, and they considered him what Giorgio Agamben calls bare life by the Romans. And there's a lot of comparisons to that in prison populations today. Um, which are highly people of color, right? In the United States, was we incarcerate more people than any other nation on the planet, and it very drastically disproportionately people of color, um, and among them especially, although it's getting close between African Americans and um, uh, Latinx people now, uh, it's still I believe the African Americans are the most are the highest people who are in prisons. So he's considered collateral damage. At first, and if you read the stories, um, yes, they do ask the Jewish people who they should set free, and they, they have them set someone else free. But that's just like Pontius Pilate, this Egypt, this, this Roman guy, um, kind of uh, 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 being, being, you know, magnanimous in the quotes, I guess, as the Roman oppressor that he is to the Jews. Um, so only through retrospective narratives superimposed on uh, Christ's followers was there the action of the cross deemed a sacrifice. Lots of other people were put up on, were crucified that day, right? Um, that was just the way Romans killed people, <laughs> one of them anyway. It became a sacrifice the more the movement became Roman, by the way. So again, there's no pure religion. There's no idea of Christianity for the first several hundred years after Christ. The death of their savior and the idea of Christianity only emerges more and more so as uh, the emerging Christians want to distinguish themselves from Jews and become more and more Roman and eventually it becomes the Roman religion under um, Emperor Constantine in the 300s. Um, so uh, I, I take issue I take issue with all scholars so just to, I, I respect these people and I learn a lot from them but I always like, oh, I, I don't quite believe everything they say. Um, but if you want to learn more about this on the Great Courses Plus, which is a great resource, um, there's a um, 
course offered by Bart D. Ehrman, who's also written some really important books on historical Jesus. Um, uh, this course is called How Jesus Became a God, and it resonates with his with his stuff. So um, I, I'm very, very particular there because I think the people who haven't thought about this stuff who might self-identify as Christians might think that I'm being critical in a, in a way that... Um, uh, that, that I'm not. It's not that controversial what I'm saying, but you have to have done some study in the area to, to, to notice that. Um, and so I want to really distinguish this notion of sacrifice. And like, that's something important for Christians to think about, but also something for Euro Christians, because Euro Christians don't necessarily believe in Christianity. Like I would call myself a Euro Christian. I'm culturally that way, but I don't belong to any particular church or anything, right? Um, but I'm still shaped by that culturally, um, and my whiteness shapes me that way as well. But so if we think about Native Americans, for example, um, Colonel John Shivington in Colorado here, um, uh, before the Sand Creek Massacre, which is a massive, it's a genocide. It's, one, it's the only recognized genocide right now, although there are more that scholars recognize, but nationally recognized genocide um, is the Sand Creek Massacre in the state of Colorado. He said, important, this is one of his quotes, kill and scalp all big and little nits make lice. This is not sacrifice. This is genocide, right? This is treating people as bare life. Uh, during World War II, Jews in the hall, like what people have sometimes called the Holocaust, were not sacrificed. They were murdered. That's why they call it, the Jewish people call it the Shoah or the catastrophe, not the Holocaust, which has a connotation with burnt offerings, which has a connotation with sacrifice. So be respectful when you think about Jewish culture and what Jewish people have been through by using the term the Shoah. And again, I'm going to take this, I'm taking this to the contemporary here. You can argue with me on any of this. You can just dis disagree with me. I disagree with people all the time, as you can see. <laughs> but look at like hashtag BLM or Black Lives Matter. Trayvon Martin, um, more, more recent folks like George Floyd or Breonna, like the names that we see happening over and over again. There was a story this morning about a possible lynching in California on NPR that I listened to name after name after name from contemporary recent times to Megar Evers in the 1960s. I don't want to confuse the murder that has been done and is continually being done through state recognized violence through police forces. State sanctions is to say there's state or state states allow the state allows this. And so long as we pay into the states and we fund them, this is why I think Black Lives Matter people say things like defund the police, right? Because we're implicated. I'm implicated as a taxpayer in cops who brutalize and kill and murder African-American people at a much really drastic, drastically higher rate than not, not only murder them, but put people in prison at one so, for example, I study drugs and drug culture, psychedelics, all of this stuff. Um, uh, African-American men are put into prison, go to prison um, uh, 20 times more likely an African, African-American men will go to prison for a cocaine violation than a white person, a white male. Same age, same, some, same sort of other demographics. So like, what does that tell us about our culture and drug convictions? So even drug convictions that are nonviolent are the biggest um, portion of, of who is incarcerated right now. So as our culture like liberalizes um, marijuana, um, Denver decriminalizes mushrooms, all of this stuff, um, as like mostly white people who are rich take trips to go be with ayahuasca shamans, um, either here for $900 a piece up at Estes Park, just outside of town here, or down with a, a Amazonian shaman or with indigenous people down there who are poor, who need money. And um, there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on there. This isn't to say that the drugs are bad. I don't think that the drugs are bad at all. Um, actually, I think drugs have been vilified when it's when the drug war has been a war on people. That's what the drug war is. It's a war on people and it uses the substances to say that these other things are happening. 
Um, and so that ties into this notion of sacrifice and ingesting things and controlling people religiously by what they can ingest into their own bodies, right? But that is not the same thing as saying that uh, um, the people who are murdered by the police or put into prison are the sacrifice of our culture. It might be seen that way from a Euro-Christian perspective, which I think is nasty and, and, and genocidal. And, and I think that if there's to be any kind of of, of unpacking of white privilege, for example, that that needs to be tied in with an unpacking of this much older type of, of what I call Euro-Christian history and whiteness is tied into that. So I say here, again, and I could be being controversial here, but I think it's important that literature speaks to our current times. Um, uh, the issues, um, the issue is, is about habeas viscous, which is a term by Alexander Wahelier in a book on black feminism, um, that actually black people and people of color have been left out of the notion of human that is tied to Euro-Christianity and humanism. The idea that humans are going to make everything better, like science and rationalism, and like that our laws, even our liberal laws, liberal society is going to say, you are this individual with rights, right? But the person who's outside of that, the person who's an individual who doesn't have rights, which is the way, what, the way we characterize somebody with bare life, a Gombin's term, people in Guantanamo Bay who are legally not defined as human, as persons. So personhood is a legal term that we might think, we might think of in this kind of fuzzy, like lovey-dovey way of human. And that's not exactly what's going on. There are people who are excluded, who don't get the same citizen rights rights as others. And we could talk about it in terms of gender with women, for example, historically, but we're talking currently in our nation right now with African-American specifically people. Yes, people of color more broadly, but African-American people specifically who have a specific historical relationship to slavery in this country and its inability to disestablish the slavery institution at the nation's founding. So habeas viscous is about the people who've been left out as compared to habeas corpus, which Wahelia calls a dead space. Great book, it's called um, by Wahelia called habeas viscous, if you wanna check it out. So the issue, I think that one of the issues that I, that I see going on in the, the recent movements is that there's a disrupting of privilege, especially white privilege, to include the liberal virtual and um, to, to include people who've been left out. But also there's a disruption of the liberal virtual space that thinks it can expand infinitely while extracting. And so what I mean by that is that partly what our liberal culture does is it says like, oh, well, I can recognize you and I can include you. It's like, okay, now I'm gonna recognize and include African-Americans, now Asian-Americans, now Latinx people, uh, now uh, LGBTQIA plus spectrum issues and you keep adding more and more and more. And there's this idea that like, this idea that the space that we already inhabit is a space that's infinite and can just be, we can just, if we just like label people rightly, then they then we can give them rights. I call it the politics of recognition. I think that Black Lives Matter is about disrupting the idea that that space is infinite to begin with right the idea is not that there is infinite space the idea is that there's actually limited space that our planet has limited resources and that people need to find ways to share and not be stingy and not like like just rest on privileges that they've inherited over time including my own my own like I said I said I identify as a white male right and i believe that that white male privilege needs to be deconstructed decolonized and that that's a matter of my own ethics as well and it's a tricky thing to do and what that means for me as a white male is maybe different than 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 what somebody else might need to do to be decolonized for sure um, so I can't talk about that in terms of like what other folks might need to do but I can think about it for myself for sure um, so um, I think that that's what Black Lives Matter, that, and, and that's why I can I can be very much behind Black Lives Matter, right? And not just not just in terms of claiming allyship or like going out and like like some white folks did early on, especially go to protests and just like take selfies. It's like I want to be part of the experience to show how much of an ally I am. It's like you know, well then unpack what white privilege is, right? Like then 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 take a step back and let black leaders lead.
for example. And it's not even that let black leaders lead. It's not like you have the power to let them lead. It's like, it's like give up the thing that ha allows you to think that you have the power to let somebody else do or not let anybody else do anything. At, uh, shut the F up, as many, I think, people w um, uh, in the movement would say. Now, I'm in a lecture. I'm in a class that this is like a different sort of space. And so I might be sympathetic to somebody saying, yeah, and you, Roger, you shut the F up too. But uh, I'm, I'm in a different educational context. So please respect that <laughs> as well. Um, uh, and respect the fact that 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 uh, the emotional work that needs to be done around this, it cannot just be left up to um, uh, um, uh, the politics of recognition and inclusion where I just like say like, oh, I'm going to get an African-American person to come and speak this stuff on my in my lecture for them, which is one way of giving a space to African-American voices, but it's also a way of exploiting another person's emotional um, resources in order to do the work that I think white people need to be doing, and especially white males, but especially white males like me. Um, <clears throat> So uh, uh, that's my reading of Black Lives Matter, and that, that's, that's tying into this notion of sacrifice. Um, the issue is dis about disrupting privilege to include, to include and disrupting the liberal virtual space that thinks it can expand indefinitely, um, while it's doing this appropriating and ingesting and digesting out the other, where it's just taking resources from the planet, taking uh, resources from the Amazon, taking spiritual resources from other people like my native american friends say like they took our land and they gave us their god and now they've come back and the like the neo shaman people want to take our spiritual spiritual practices as well too so it's like there's just no end of appropriation of indigenous peoples for example to um, take a, a closely related example here um so and then digesting the other into a body politic called humanity Fred Moten is one of many recent um, African-American in, uh, intellectuals who's writing about this stuff, black bodies in public space. Also, Alexander Wahelier. My uh, thing is frozen again up here, so I'm going to take a pause. Also, I was getting very heated there. I'm going to take a glass of water <laughs> as well. Um, feel free to disagree with me, um, uh, but this stuff, sh if it's riling up your emotions, good. That's what literature should do, even ancient literature. I'm back, and um, and so you notice I'm, I'm I'm getting very passionate about this stuff, and my mind goes to all of these these places, and I think that this is part, partly the work that literature does on us. I think that it very much is deeply ethical work to be thinking about this stuff, um, uh, and and uh, I've been using this term, I, and I can share, but de definitely that the article that I, that and the definition that I get for this term Euro Christian comes from my colleague, friend, and mentor, uh, Tink Tinker, who wrote um, uh, an article called What Are We Gonna Do With White People? And it's on the newpolis.com. Uh, um, if you email me, I can share the link with you, but you can Google it too. Um, and uh, so what's important, as I talk about Christianity and Euro-Christianity, um, I do think Euro-Christianity is different than um, what we see happening in African-American churches in the United States, for example. Um, and if some, anybody has seen this, there's a great, great video of um, Riverside Baptist Church in New York um, from a few years ago. It's a talk with Ruby Sales, who's an important activist from the um, 1960s, um, and Michelle Alexander, who wrote an important book called The New Jim Crow. And some of that legal stuff I was talking about a few minutes ago comes from Michelle Alexander's book. Um, uh, um, uh, the celebration was to celebrate um, the 50th anniversary of the Beyond Vietnam speech, um, uh, which was a speech that uh, that Martin Luther King delivered um, in the 1968, but was written by Dr. Vincent Harding who um, is recently is deceased now, but he was taught at Iliff School of Theology, which is where um, I went to school. <laughs> I just graduated from there. And so you're see, you're getting actually Vincent Harding through Tink Tinker, through me, I think, and, and some of that. Um, and, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I, I, uh, man, I get really passionate about, about that stuff. Um, so Euro-Christianity, which I, is, is a way I, I 
use the term not just to it, it Oh, very much overlaps with what we might think of as whiteness, but it also helps us not just think in terms of color barriers, but to think of entrenched cultural notions. And so it's not just about belief in Christianity either. So you can be Euro-Christian like myself and not be a believer in Christianity, um, but still be shaped by the cultural forces. So it's a way of talking about that stuff. Um, also, so a lots, of, lots of other Christianities in the world, right? So like Coptic Christianity in Egypt, not the same thing as Euro Christian. So just keep that stuff in mind um, if you're thinking about different kinds of, of religion. And, and also keep in mind that idea that's come up a couple of times in the lecture so far that I don't see any religion as being a kind of pure religion. That's really important that they, um, we do talk about religious hybridity, but I think that um, uh, we, we should generally think of religious hy hybridity. That said, the term religion itself as my friend Tink Tinker will say, comes out of Christianity and gets labeled onto other cultures as well. So like there wasn't something called Hinduism until British colonialists went in and named it Hinduism. That yes, there are other deities and there's lots of practices that pre-exist that. But when you call it a religion and then you try and put all of these rules into it, it becomes a scholarly study problem. So just something to think about that. That's some religious studies, um, a philosophy of religion stuff there. So sacri back to sacrifice here. What I think is important is not to confuse murder, especially the murder of people who are things saying, like saying things like, I can't breathe, right? <laughs> like, like who are completely helpless in that moment, right? It's like one thing to like take somebody out. He's like, like, you know, pulling out a machine gun and like they're trying to gun you down. This is, is different. Like when you have like multiple police officers standing around somebody like, and, and you have somebody pinned to the ground, it's like saying that they can't breathe or like unarmed children, for example. Um, this is that, these are, that that's just murder, right? And to confuse murder in the most heinous and and um, grossest forms of, of like material disregard for life or the objectification of a body as life like is 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 so far from what sacrifice is that it's important to make that distinction here um okay i'm going to move on um back to dionysus here um so i came all the way into the present <laughs> And now Dionysus and the Bacchae. This is the last section of, of my lecture for this week. Um, and um, uh, so Dionysus the god and Bacchae are the women followers, or also called the Minads, right, who follow um, Dionysus. Um, Dionysus is said to be from the east, but he's there are clearly significant differences in different places. I tried to hit that um, we don't see Dionysus showing up in the blood sacrifices of Israelite and Hebrew religion, right? Um, the, that kind of scapegoat thing. But we do see goats, we see animals being sacrificed in these different areas. Um, the Bacchae associate the, um, are associated, that should have a D there, sorry, um, with the Corybants um, and the Kettledrum, who that's, the, um, Carson says they invent the Kettledrum. Um, these were Phrygian worshippers, so kind of again from across the sea, from from, um, uh, and they are mountain worship, like worshippers of a mountain goddess named um, Sibylle, um, or Sibyl, um, who in turn uh, gave it to satyrs, which are like we talked about earlier on in the lectures, those kind of constantly erect horse half half man half horse things, um, who are always going around messing with people. Um, uh, who then give it to the Bacchae or the Minads, right? So there's a kind of lineage there. And that's a specific one with the Corybants, right? So can compare that to like the Yahweh culture that develops around the city of Judah, um, right? And then it becomes associated with Ju um, Jerusalem. Uh, um, Dionysus is also said to be from the east and as far back as India. So nobody like really knows. Sometimes there's also comparisons with Egyptian um, uh, situations as well. Um, uh, it was the nymphs and the nymphs of Nisa, um, so Dionysia, god of Nisa, right? Um, and uh, that, uh, and there was supposedly a Nisa on Mount Parnassus. So this is in Greece, right? And I just put a little picture, a current picture of Mount, Mount Parnassus. Um, there was supposedly a place where nymphs lived in Nisa, 
And it was supposedly those nymphs who suckled the newborn Dionysus and gave him loving care. So when after Dionysus pops out of Zeus's um, uh, uh, leg, he's an infant still and he needs to be taken care of. But like Hera, we know Zeus's partner, main partner, does not, you know, like Dionysus. There's also the idea that he's a he's like the other gods are jealous because there's never been like a half person, half god thing. And of course, again, then again, if you want to think that, you know, later versions of Christianity, like the blend of the mortal and the divine, right, is just showing up in Dionysus beforehand. Um, hence why I've kind of gone into like Euro Christianity um, and, and that kind of the religions of the book route. I think that that is in, it's important to distinguish the traditions, but also to see how they and somehow some seem to be informing each other, right? Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so he um, is given to these nymphs kind of hidden away, which is another theme in literature, like the child who's being hidden away, who's going to come back later on. Um, and he's suckled by these nymphs who take care of him. But it's also important, I think, to notice, as I've said in the lectures, that Dionysus moves. Um, I've held up these books already. Um, uh, they, there's, it's important to compare um, Dionysus also to the Eleusinian Mysteries. Let me just show you that, that word for those of you who don't know it. Um, or the Mysteries of Eleusis, which is another place in Greece with, it, with its own ceremonies and sacrifices, and the mysteries that are happening. And this gets mentioned in the play that you read for today which is that like the mysteries are not supposed to be looked upon. So Pentheus is going and he's spying on things that are supposed to be secret. And that's one of the transgressions that gets him killed. Um, uh, and the same thing would have happened with the Eleusinian mysteries. So we know that they happen. We have a lot of information now. Scholars have a lot of information about things that happen. Sometimes sacrifices that um, are called suotorelia um, or um, boar or pig, um, goat and um, uh bull sacrifices where initiate lays in these troughs where and they actually sacrificed um and let the blood drain out over the initiate um might sound gross but these are things that happened and lots of different kinds of sacrifices in different places at different times remember that bull a bull is sacrificed before the dionysian festival begins um so these are some uh, things to Walter Otto says makes this comparison in his book and his book comes out in 1933 and it's published in English around 1960 but it's written in German um, and there's important stuff to be thinking about in terms of German thought in that time period especially as Nazis are coming to power Walter Otto does um, not he, he he's just distinguishes himself and his people around him distinguish him from being being in a uh, um, like an official Nazi, although he did have a um, post in a school and you, you had to sort of officially be a member of a party. But he wasn't like people who were like for Nazism, like like Martin Heidegger and Carl Schmitt, who are some other important thinkers um, in that way. And he eventually, he eventually gets silenced by the Nazis for his stuff. But still, I do think it's important to think back historically on, on this stuff and what's what he's saying because mythology became so important for some of the fascists like the Nazi um, stuff. Um, in this book, he says, in Eleusis, the fortunes of Demeter and her daughter, who's Persephone. So Demeter is a grain goddess and Persephone, um, if you know the story, Persephone goes down. Uh, uh, Hades from the underworld comes up and, and grabs Persephone and marries her and um, Demeter goes low around looking for her daughter Persephone and, and while she does all of the crops all around the whole all the vegetation of the world die and because she's mourning the loss of her daughter and she can't be doing her regenerative things so uh, the gods get upset and they're like well you know somebody tells her that Hades took her so she goes down to Hades and they make a deal where Persephone gets to come up to the world and be with Demeter for half of the year and go down to the underworld for the other half of the year. And so what this becomes is an etiological myth, right? That causational myth for how the seasons develop is that Persephone is in the underworld for half the year. That's the winter time, like fall into winter and spring. And then spring, when she comes up again, then things start blooming. And then there's, then, you know, descends again. People start, uh, Demeter gets sad as she Persephone goes back to the underworld. 
Um, so that's what, who they're worshiping at Eleusis, Demeter and Persephone. Um, the women who serve them uh, at, at serve Dionysus are wholly similar, says Otto, in their actions and their suffering to female attendants who are inseparably bound to him by myth. Otto also, among other scholars like Victor Turner here, emphasizes the experiential immediacy of cult and myth. He doesn't want to reduce myth to saying that like, well, myth is just like the way that we think about like the aspects of our psyche, like in some ways that Jungian psychologists might do too. And that's not to like poo poo Jungian psychologists. I am critical of Jung and I'm critical, critical of like, um, like not very intellectually based um, uh, ways of, of just jumping into archetypal theory and the hero's journey and seeing everything as a structure there's clearly more like like in-depth intellectual stuff to be going into um and and union theory might actually in terms of psychoanalytic theory might indeed help people i went and saw one once who did sand, sandbox theory which i thought was a really interesting idea in terms of therapy um but i couldn't afford um, I went to the first initial free session, but they wanted $150 a session after, and I just couldn't afford that. So, but definitely there are union therapists out there just saying. Um, um, Otto, among others, uh, others such as Victor Turner, emphasized the experiential immediacy of the cult, which ought not to be reduced to etiological, euhemerist, or psychological readings, nor should we confuse ancient practices with post-industrial ones. And this is a big thing that Victor Turner points out in his book. And, and I think that that Otto points out in his book, and this is what distinguishes him from like other like Nazis, because there's a Nazi contingent that wants to be that do the archaic revival, that wants to go back and reclaim like the Volkish Germanic roots and Germanic myth and and um, uh, these big like book burning ceremonies and all of that kind of stuff going on. Um, Walter Otto says in the book, this is like stupid to think that you can like go back in time and um, like gather what it might have meant to actually participate in myth as it um, saturates life. Victor Turner says this a lot, and he's specifically talking about this in terms of what he calls social drama or um, what we might call protest movements, which are social dramas. And he says to confuse social dramas, he's really talking, he writes this book in the early 80s, but he's talking about the 60s in mind. He's like to confuse the social drama of protest movements um, just with sort of Dionysian what's happening in ancient culture is is a wrong thing to do because things work differently in post-industrial culture and that's where he comes up with that distinction between the liminal which is from the culture where there was no choice and the liminoid which is about kind of liberal culture where there is choice um, and so again I would say I want to beware of beware of two easy conflict conflations among people who are archaic revivalists or neo shamans and burners when it comes to this stuff now there's all sorts of fascinating stuff to talk about and think about in the 1960s i wrote a book about psycho psycho psychedelic aesthetics and some of this protest stuff um the raising of the levitation of the pentagon and that protest like so that's an interesting sort of comparison to think about how protest movements worked 50 years ago versus now just like it's important to look at the beyond vietnam speech and what had not happened since vincent harding wrote that and what has still not happened to now to today um so it's important to think about this stuff in protest movements um, but i don't want you to just draw this kind of like straight line from sacrifice movements and the disruptions that i'm seeing in these texts the social disruptions from pre-industrial to post-industrial society nor do i want you to map on to that some sort of linear notion of civilization and that civilization is going to hell when we see these protest movements because that already implies that there was this kind of very like like it's it's supporting white supremacy right to say that like that that, that civilization is being destroyed by by the fact that people who've been like marginalized from a, a dominantly white supremacist society i'm talking about society being like at a social level being privileging white people over non-white people right um that 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 has left people out and to say that that, that to to lament like the loss of civilization you have some serious kind of racial white supremacist thinking to be unpacking if you're making those types of claims i would say
um, or you have some hubris to deal with, right? So uh, hubris in the Bacchae, just to go back to the text really quick as we as I shift to the end here. Um, in the text, hubris, we're applying, I asked you to apply Aristotle's terms. This is one of them. Far, uh, page 32, far off in the sky live the gods who never die, but they watch us. They watch how far we press our limits. There's a morning star, there's an evening star, don't press too far. It's great, like, I just love Anne Carson as a poet as much as a translator. Um, very much part of Greek culture, the gods are not friends with Greek people. They, that, that should be very clear, right? Um, uh, uh, um, the gods disdain, but also in terms of sacrifice and ritual theory, the gods need sacrifice at the same time. So there is this kind of relationship that sacrifice plays, but um, the gods are mean. <laughs> to, I mean, in the Iliad and the Odyssey all the time, they're just, they mess with people all the time. Um, they sometimes like people and let people have, get away with certain things and stuff, but then hubris is this limit. Um, another thing to think about with that, like the morning star, the evening star, what I think that is so great about what Anne Carson does is that she's signaling the Pan, Pan the goat god, who is Peter Pan with his little horns, um, who in some ways is, is, is um, I'm satyr-like, um, but of course satyr is the horse thing too as well. So uh, he's kind of half goat, doing the half goat, um, half child thing. Um, it's very much associated with, with uh, Dionysus, and Dionysus mentions him in the play. Um, Pan plays the flutes, right? And the flutes were so part of the competition at Dionysian, Dionysian ceremonies, or the fl people playing the flutes. The flutes contrast with the corybants and the drums. So you have the drums and the kettle drums, and you have the fl flutes being played. So if you think about Pan, the great, the goat god, Peter Pan, um, and Neverland, like the star, like 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 straight onto the left and like 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 third start of the left and straight on till morning that kind of stuff from the peter pan play by um j m bari which has its own kind of colonialist racist stuff going on in it um uh, but nevertheless has a lot to say it's important to see how the structure of thought works um so it's not like saying don't ever read it um but neverland so neverland think about neverland as a dionysian space the utopia of neverland um great essay um, called Other Worlds or Other Maps Showing Through by um, a, a scholar I can't think of right now, but you can email me if you want. Um, in the Secret Garden, classic children's book, um, uh, there's pan elements showing up definitely between um, the character Dickon um, and other, or Dicon and other uh, characters in that book. Um, and Wind in the Willows, the there's a chapter in Wind in the Willows called Piper at the Gates of Dawn, which of course there's a Pink Floyd record called Piper of the Ga at the Gates of Dawn that refers to this. So 1960s culture definitely drew on elements of sacrifice, Dionysus, and psychedelic stuff. You think about Alice, like um, feed your head, right? That line from uh, uh, the the um, Jefferson Airplane song, right? About um, uh, um, go ask Alice, right? The um, uh, eating mushroom, one, one makes you bigger, one makes you fall. So psychedelic culture in the 60s is definitely dealing with this stuff. It's important to think about that. It's important to think about ingestion. It's important to think about drugs. It's important to think about the history of the inequity of drugs and that drug wars are wars on people, not wars on substances. And those wars on people are are definitely targeted in terms of race stuff and who gets included and who is not. Um, Edwardian and Victorian literature is just full of references to Pan and Dionysus. Um, the, when one of the odes that the chorus, the Bacchae, who are the chorus in this play, right? I mentioned chorus in an earlier lecture. Um, the chorus is the justice element, but in, interestingly in this play, the chorus is the Bacchae. So the Bacchae, I don't know if I would call it justice, I don't, I'd say, maybe divine reckoning um but uh dionysus will fill your soul with peace it's not about intellectual prowess it's not about true and false it's about pure release again nice poetry from ann carson but also that rejection like like walter otto says in his book on dionysus you cannot put this just into like scholarly mythological categories of euhemerist or etiological or psychoanalytic 
you can't do it. It's about a whole fabric of everybody being caught up in the frenzy. Um, is there hubris? I, I asked this question, is there hubris in neo shamans and psychonauts attempting to induce this saying like, well, if I trip a bunch of LSD or if I trip a bunch of mushrooms, can I induce something like the sacrifice or the Dionysian night Dionysian experience, but because of the pureness of going into those types of experiences and lots and lots of literature on psychedelics talks about this and makes these kinds of comparisons and Burning Man, people who go to Burning Man make these kind of comparisons um, and great movies like Wicker Man, who a friend of me emailed me about in recent weeks and reminded me of that that movie. The, watch the first version. I like it better than the remake with, with Nicolas Cage, but interpretations are interesting too. Um, so we see when Wicker Man, an early version of Burning Man, definitely um, you can see that uh, relationship there. Um, but, you know, the whole idea that I could induce a tr by a trip, whether I'm doing psychedelic theory, um, which I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of psychedelic theory, I'm saying, so I'm not like the theory that the therapy is fine. But but to can say that what you're doing there is capturing this Dionysian experience or sacrifice. I would say hold off there. I would say that there's something different going on. Um, uh, and the same thing, that is just the weird thing that like, you know, the business card with like your shamanic practice on it. I find that strange. Um, sacrifice and doubling, again, twinning in Bacchae. Uh, um, uh, Pentheus says this. <laughs> he says, you know, I seem to see two sons. And he's, he's kind of having this hallucinatory thing going on. Uh, and a double Thebes, two cities, each with all its seven gates. And you look like a bull leading me in the procession. You've got horns growing out of your head. Were you perhaps an animal all the time? You certainly, you're certainly a bull at the moment. And so the stranger, and we know that Dionysus has been playing with his form as a bull and a stranger throughout the play. And now Pentheus is seeing this, but we also see, as Rene Girard points out in one of his good moments, you see this kind of twinning and doubling between the cousins of Bacchae, uh, or sorry, of um, Dionysus and Pentheus um, uh, um, themselves. So like like the frenzy and the thinker um, sort of um, um, moving together there as well. Um, and so what is this to say except that the sacrifice, who is the sacrifice? And the play, dun, 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 drum roll, is like, of course, so Pentheus is the sacrifice, right? The king is the sacrifice in the play. Um, another brilliant, brilliant moment of Anne Carson is her reference to In the Pines and murder ballads of the 19th century and song. And so the, she's showing the depth of her folkloric knowledge here as she translates this. Dionysus says, be careful, though, you mustn't do damage. She's talking to Pentheus because Pentheus wants to like go get a better view of the women. Uh, be careful, though, you mustn't do damage to the Temple of the Nymphs or the places where Pan plays his pipe. So there's the reference to Pan. And Pentheus says, good point. Brute forces out. Doesn't work with women anyhow. I'll hide in the pines. And that that line in the pines, like... Um, so some of you might have heard, like the probably the most popular recent example of this is Nirvana's cover of Lead Belly's version of um, uh, um, My Girl or In the Pines. And so like the lyrics go, my girl, my girl, don't lie to me. Tell me where did you sleep last night? Right. Uh, in, the, in, in another lyric, In the Pines, In the Pines where the sun never shines. But there's lots and lots of folk loric songs in English culture that deal with this place of in the pines that come from these specific genre of song called murder ballads and it's you're out in nature you're in the pines where the sun never shines and this is where weird stuff happens this is where sex happens this is sometimes where rapey things happen so it's not always good sex could be but maybe not this is where lots of people get killed and all sorts of song lyrics down by the river if you think about even the Neil Young song lyrics, right? Like down by the river, I shot my baby dead. All of that kind of stuff is going on. And this is very tied into African-American um, folk culture as well. And Lead Belly, an African, one of the greatest African-American performers 
and just I would say just like I mean, it's important that he's African American, but he's like he is just one of the most important performers of all time, if you ask me. And he is our only access in some cases to songs from the 19th century because he was old when he was recorded playing them. So um, uh, songs like uh, Irene Goodnight, um, which becomes a big hit in the 1950s, comes from that that as well. So um, this way, it's a very subtle thing that Ann Carson as a Canadian poet introduced this American thing into her play, but just by saying, I'll hide in the pines. And that should signal things to those of us in um, throughout uh, uh, the current cultures that are, you know, in some ways dominating what Native Americans call Turtle Island, right? Which is North South America. Turtle Island is what the natives call this place. Um, but very much uh, 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 an interesting choice of words there by Ann Carson, the translator. And um, let's go one more here. Um, introducing the notion of the panic. So here is a great, in the servant's narration. So notice how there's this shift of dramatic shift of perspective away from characters to a third person perspective of the narrator. We don't actually see uh, Pentheus die on stage and that would have been typical for Greek plays as well. Um, but uh, we get this different account, this shift to narrative time, in some ways shift to chronological time. So if you go back to Dalamore's uh, quotes from early on in my lecture about moving into like kickstarting history, that's kind of like, Ann Carson, I feel like is just completely doing that right with this shift to the, the, narr the servant's narration. But the servant says, um, but the stranger suddenly vanished and a voice came out of the air. It was probably Dionysus shouting, here he is, women. I bring you the man who mocks me and mocks my holy rites. Punish him. And he, as he said this, a column of fire shot between heaven and earth. Then silence fell, silence through the wood and on the leaves and every animal was silent. You could not hear a twitch. That is this notion of panic. It's a great story, I believe, E.M. Forrester from the early 1900s called The Story of a Panic that does this quite well as well. The character's name is Eustace. It's about a little boy who's basically a pan or Dionysus type of figure. He's kind of an idiot savant. Um, but this notion, you can like think about this in all sorts of horror films and horror culture in general, or maybe you've experienced this yourself camping. It's a great camping creep town like when all of the animals sort of go quiet right and this notion of silence really pregnant silence where dread sinks in that notion of panic and the word pan meaning all all encompassing sort of s zeroing in and basically you are screwed right <laughs> trying to capture the emotion of the moment right that is so important that comes out of this liter this ancient literature. That aesthetic notion alone, super historically important. And so coming back to Aristotle's terms here as we're wrapping up, Agave and Cadmos are having this discussion, and this is where I would say we see agnoresis or peripatia. These are Aristotle's terms for recognition, agnore and agnoresis, and peripatia, the reversal of fate or fortune. Um, so the metting out of justice was, was important to this play um, is perhaps, or simply like, maybe it's not justice, but divine reckoning um, is intergenerational within a family in Greek culture. Pentheus is a fool, but Agave had also mocked Dionysus. And so Cadmos too, despite his reverence for with Tiresias, who's like the seer, right? He's the blind seer in lots of Greek plays, who just kind of disappears in this play. Um, even though Cadmos tries to be reverent with Tiresias and they go out together and Cadmos tries to tell Pentheus that he should do the same thing. These old guys who are, they know they look ridiculous, but they're, they're accepting Dionysus. Um, Cadmos as founder of the city gets implicated in the city's injustice in not recognizing um, Dionysus. So Cadmos says to Agave, um, what a first-rate sacrifice you offer the gods. And this is after she herself has killed her son, torn him apart with the other Maenads, torn apart Pentheus. And she's holding Pentheus's 
decapitated head in her lap, and she, it's taking her a while to come back to her senses and recognize it. There's a compare. She says, "Where does this happen?" And and um, Cadmus says, "Where the dogs tore Actaeon apart." And this comes from another myth um, that Ovid writes about in the Metamorphoses, which is um, uh, Actaeon was a hunter um, who. Um, goes and he comes upon artemis the goddess of the hunt who is bathing naked and no one is allowed to look at her bathing naked and he comes across her seeing her and he thinks she's beautiful um and she finds out that she has that he has seen her and nobody's allowed to look at her being naked and so his fate is to have his own hunting dogs chase him down and tear him apart so that's there's a literary allusion there a reference to another play lots of intertextuality is another term that we use in literary studies for the ways that different stories feed into one another. Um, in the Pines is another version of that inter intertextuality. Um, uh, Dionysus destroyed us. I recognize it now. It's right there in the play as lines, the recognition moment or anagnoresis, moving from a place of unknowing to a place of knowing. Gnoskin is the term in Greek. Um, Pentheus, but Pentheus, this is Cadmus, or, or sorry, no, Cadmus says first, he was outraged by your hubris. You denied he was a god. He's talking to Agave. And then, um, uh, uh, and, 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 and at first, you know, Agave isn't really recognizing it either, the her part in it. And, and Cadmus says again, but P Pentheus was like you. He denied the god. And so, has joined us all and together um, in single ruination. You, himself, our house, and me. All of our fates as a family are tied together. This is the exact kind of opposite of liberal culture that says like, you're an individual, you do the crime, you do the time. Or you're an individual with rights that are like inalienable. That is completely different culture than the ancient Greek culture, which says that, which does visit the sins of one generation onto another um uh um but there's something that we might learn from this when we're talking about things like the unrecognition un unrecognized aspects of something like white privilege for example in in present day culture or intergenerational trauma among people of color not even just african americans but among indigenous peoples as well who continually to be the recipients of violence that comes from um, at a cultural or institutional level um, uh, that operates above the well intentions of many, I would think many individual white people are not necessarily racist, but that doesn't mean that white supremacy doesn't still exist um, culturally or and, 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 need, and that white privilege, for example, doesn't need to be reckoned with um, and, 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 and really dealt with. Um, even among folks who are fairly like I'm very sympathetic to Black Lives Matter, but that does not mean that I still don't have work. It's daily, daily work um, if you're going to be committed to anti-racism, for example. And I, I think of myself as committed to anti-racism, but but that does not mean that you just, you know, read X books or you go to some rallies or, you know, you like, like uh, give money to Black Lives Matter, all these things I've done and I continue to study and, but but that that process of decolonizing one's own privilege is something that it's it is inherited intergenerationally, and so I think that there's without compare, without saying that we live in the same society, without doing that neo shamanic thing that's or the archaic revival thing that says we can go back and access some earlier point in history. No, I think I think that we need to instead unpack instead of trying to skip over history, unpack how history continues to inform us and continues to inform gross versions of injustice that sometimes might even mask itself as being sacrifice like what people have said about the holocaust and it's just not true murder is murder it's just not there's nothing sacred about it it's it's it's, it's awful um and if you blend it with notions of patriotism and nationalism which people do take as sacred and then they try to sacralize murder that's where I think great injustice is being done, unfortunately, and concurrently keeps being done to people of color generally, but especially African Americans. Um, so a couple more lines here. Um, 
Pentheus, you were like it. You like he's like agave. You have to recognize that you are part of this too. And I, I Cadmos, like who thought I was doing the right thing, right? Like who thought I was revering Dionysus, I'm still implicated as well. And so they both get turned into snakes snakes right and there's this moment of recognition like the peripatia and anagnoresis kind of come close together oh father here is my life it should be is not if um is my life turned upside down literally the reversal in fortune right and the reversal of being the king of thebes the founder of thebes to being the exiled snake um so here are a couple of further things to think about um, i'm not going to go into them today i've talked to you plenty um uh, you might compare a little bit more if you get really interested in the scapegoat, the scapegoat mechanism, how people are labeled scapegoats, how that works with racism, racial epithets, um, uh, calling people criminals when they're not, designating a certain class of people or group of people as being inherently more cr prone to criminal activity, which is exactly what racial profiling among police does, claiming itself as science and, and ma masking itself behind science. It puts more people of color behind bars, for example. Um, so you might compare um, the double snakes to the scapegoat and, and this idea of the pharmacon. Um, that's that Leviticus story. Um, because uh, you get a lot of that Euro-Christian stuff informing um, contemporary um, culture in the U.S. You get more of that than you get Greek tragedy, for sure. Um, you might compare to the Pythian Oracle, which is the Oracle at Delphi, um, which is the Apollos Oracle. Um, uh, and the Pythian Oracle is actually a virgin who is also associated with a snake, Python. We get the name Python from that. Um, and she's wrapped around the snake sometimes. Um, and she communes with, should be with, not with, Apollo. Um, uh, and then again, compare that Apollo and Dionysus thing, right? We know that the Athenians reject, who are like very Apollo and Athena sort of based, that we get um, a rejection of Dionysus at the first, but then we get a blend. So Athena, who's you know goddess of wisdom, uh, at Athens, they have to deal with Dionysus. At Thebes, they have to deal with Dionysus. At Delphi, which is Apollo's place, they need to deal with Dionysus as well. And so it might not be as clear of a binary distinction as someone like Nietzsche used to say in comparison between the Apollonian and the Dionysian. Um, we want to see these as part of this two of the same. Um, you might compare them to Socrates' concept of anamnesis or forgotten memory, and this comes from uh, um, a philosophical idea that we are split in two, that our souls are split in two um, before birth, um, and that uh, um, we're always searching for our long lost soulmate. Sometimes it gets gendered as well. Um, so it's a forgotten memory or the remembering of things and so this says that like that actually there is a kind of kernel of wisdom or knowledge that exists deep in our psyche that needs to be recovered that it's in there that needs to be uncovered um, and that later informs that idea of anamnesis later informs things like psychoanalysis but it's a really old concept and it comes from um, an allegory or a story that that socrates tells us about two souls being split um, i think in the symposium um, we see some of that especially but also in the Phaedrus. So one other uh, other ancient text to compare to, if you want to move on with this, um, are um, the, is theories of writing itself. And, and this happens in Plato's Phaedrus and in the Gorgias, which is another dialogue. Um, and you can compare that to a really, really famous essay by the post-structuralist critic Jacques Derrida, um, who um, wrote a famous, famous essay called Plato's Pharmacy. So those are more places to go in terms of literary criticism, more thinking about this stuff. Lots of Victorian and Edwardian literature if you want to deal with Pan. I've written on some of that stuff myself. I'm going to end there for this week. I hope that I've, you know, at some point challenged you. You don't have to agree with everything that I say. You certainly don't have to agree with things that I say that might um, inform things like controversial subjects like Black Lives Matter. You not, don't need to agree with my take on that in order to pass this class. This is why I ask you to do your thinking and your writing first outside of and before this lecture. These lectures are to stimulate you, to show you 
There's so much going on in ancient literature and thinking about sacrifice. We're moving on. We'll think about tragedy again to modern tragedy with Macbeth and there will be some crossover, but we're jumping you know, almost 2,000 years between this lecture and the next lecture. So let's be humble. Let's not get our hubris on, right, about thinking that we can cover everything. Um, but uh, uh, for intro people, you know, thinking about the different regions of ancient culture, not just thinking of Western civilization as Greeks or even just the Greeks and Judaic culture, but being able to parse out things more than that without just tying Western like when we read Greek tra tragedies tra without tying that into a notion of just Western civilization automatically, right? No, we know that Western civilization needs to be unpacked. But one of the ways that we can unpack it is that we can see in recent translations like Ann Carson's work in where she shows a kind of dissent, right? This comes back to my main thesis that I started with. Like, Euripides as a dying old man, like, I mean, he's dead by the time that the play is put on for the first time. He dies in 405. I think it wins the the festival, the award at the festival in 406 BCE. Uh, sorry, the other way, he dies in 406. He, it's put on in 405 BCE, counting down. Um, destroying an entire city. Like, I mean, I guess you could say that he's saying, we should look back to the gods in some sort of very conservative way. But I think of it as much more of a warning to city culture. It's a warning to pro culture that thinks it's being progressive when it's not, when it hasn't accounted for everything. And maybe that's something that I would like to think about too in terms of literature itself is like thinking of tragedy not as this conservative place where a lot of very conservative scholarship has gone towards mythology, but thinking it a, of it as places of dissent. And that's the way I'll treat Macbeth next week, but that's the way I want to, that I think that Ann Carson arguably treats Euripides. Um, and then mapping that onto now, like a lot of us come in liberal culture to ideas of social justice with a progress narrative like that things have gotten better. But what we clearly see going on is our, in our culture is that the same things keep coming up over and over again, the same kinds of injustice. And so for African-American people, as I said in a previous lecture, for example, the current movements are part of a much older movement. As Ruby Sales, the great activist said, the first um, runaway slave was not a criminal, but was a person who started a movement. And it's that movement that say African-American uh, um, uh, activists, um, in some cases, um, church movements want to tap into. And that I think is very, very different than the culture that said that that runaway slave was a criminal. And that criminalizes to this day, to a much greater extent than white folks, that criminalizes people of color. Um, at a completely disproportionate, like factually disproportionate, there's nothing emotional about that. It is the fact that we put way more people of color into prison than other places. And also, unfortunately, people are being um, brutalized and, and uh, murdered by people who should be standing in for our state um, and think of themselves. I'm sure um, many police officers think of themselves as doing this bigger duty um, for the state, but there's, we have problems right now in our culture. I haven't solved them, but hopefully that um, I, I've, I've said that like by looking at tragedy's ability to see dissent um, and reading it from that angle, that we can think even way back to ancient tragedies and bring them into our current relationships. That's what I think that literary criticism should do and the study of literature should do. It shouldn't just be historical, it should be theoretical and it should give us fodder to talk about now. It should be in the moment now. Okay, talked a lot. Thank you very much for attending and paying attention to this lecture, even if you've watched it on multiple sessions. They're here as recordings for you to go back to them. Um, carry on, we're on to Macbeth. Read the play first, deal with it on your own before doing spark notes or any of that other stuff. I'm more interested in you dealing with it on your own, even if you don't understand it. Even if you write 
your discussion posts about not understanding things. Ask questions. That's what I'm here for. That's what your classmates are here for. Ask questions, ponder things together, do some of the work on your own before looking at other things. And definitely deal with the text on its own and writing about it on its own before you watch the film version, because the film version is just one person's interpretation. So next week you'll have two lectures, one on Macbeth and one on uh, the film um, uh, adaptation of, of Macbeth. Um, okay, but this is long enough for this week. Thank you again for your attention. I look forward to reading all of your stuff and making this before I've read your, your posts this week. So. Um, uh, take care, and we will see you next week. Office hours for questions, email for questions. Um, happy to talk to you more. Thanks.